everybody in our Start Today community. We've got over a half million members. Come on, never too late to join in. Scan the QR code to subscribe to our newsletter and get the jump start to improve your health. And what better way to kick off the new year than highlighting some of our community members. On this special episode, we're going to introduce you to four folks who have made huge strides in their fitness journey. So let's get to it. This is Start Today. First up, we're going to begin with Emily Baker. A few years ago, she took control of her health and she started running for 15 seconds at a time. Those 15 seconds eventually turned into 26.2 miles when she completed the New York City Marathon in 2022. Hoda and Jenna heard about Emily's story from our Start Today group and helped her celebrate her milestone with a style makeover. Now, before we see Emily's transformation, let's hear her story. I am Emily Conley Baker. I am 34 years old and I am a mother of three, a health and wellness coach, and I'm a registered pediatric nurse. I've always been someone who put on this face every day that I had everything together, but inside I really struggled emotionally, specifically surrounding my weight and my physical appearance. In 2019, I had my youngest. About three weeks later, my father passed away visiting us. His size was a massive comorbidity of his, and ultimately it didn't allow him to effectively get the care he needed. So witnessing that tremendous loss really just sat with me. I was on the phone with my two brothers, and my brother said to me, Emily, I know you don't feel like physically you're at rock bottom, but emotionally, I think you're there. I'm so thankful they said that to me because I, for the first time, recognized that rock bottom didn't have to be about what I looked like physically. In May of 2021, Emily underwent a vertical sleeve gastrectomy. I knew that it was like my one shot to get this right. And for my 33rd birthday, I decided I was gonna run 3.3 miles. I would start running 15 seconds at a time. Started just building up little by little by little. Emily joined a running club and became part of the Start Today community. I like couldn't get enough of it because it was just people exactly like me. It kind of lights a spark within you. And you have this moment of like, wow, they've made themselves and their movement a priority today. I wanna go and do that for myself. The Queens, New York resident ran a half marathon in March of 2022, and just nine months later completed the New York City Marathon. She is now a certified run instructor, a certified personal trainer, and has lost 135 pounds to date. I couldn't have done any of this alone without my family and without the community that I created as well. When I think about all of this change, I think about my children. I have a nine-year-old. I don't think she recognizes how much of a driving force she's been for me. I'm very proud of how far I've come on the inside, emotionally, physically, but I want to portray that with my style. Emily's so nice to meet you. Interstyle so expert, so Melissa talk. Garcia. So tell me a little bit about what your personal style is currently right now. I struggle in the style department. I'm either in my nursing scrubs or I am in active wear. At the end of this, how do you want to walk out and feel? I feel so much pride and confidence in my ability to change drastically. So I want people to see that in, in what I'm wearing. I am so excited. Let's get started and start trying some clothes on. Oh, wow. Yes. When she found the winning look, it was off to the salon. Welcome to LW Salon. Thank you. They're going to make you over so it's minimum, but still fabulous. Okay, we took some inches off your hair. Now it's time to get to work. Are you ready to get a new look? I am. Okay, let's go. And we are oh, so lucky. let's go, let's go. Lucky because we are joined by Emily's family, her husband Nick, her kids Adeline, Flynn, and Cora, and her running coach, Michelle Ray. What a beautiful mom you guys have. What an amazing wife. Um, are you guys anxious to see her? Yes. Are you sure? Are y'all excited? <laughs> okay, because she looked great before. I can't imagine how cool she's gonna I know. look now. Okay, so should we look at Emily's before picture? Okay. 
And can we see Emily's new look? Come on out, Emily! <laughs> wow! Oh my gosh, Emily, you're beautiful! Like a princess. <laughs> Hi. How are you? How are you? Wow! How are you? you look awesome! Oh my gosh, I Melissa, know. this dress is ridiculous, right? <laughs> <laughs> Your husband. <laughs> <laughs> um, Melissa, why did you choose it? Okay, so oh, first of all, it was such an honor to work with you, Emily. Oh. Like I had, you were you were a blessing to me. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we talked, and she said she wanted to feel confident. She wanted her mind to catch up with her body. She said she didn't feel like they were together in yeah. sync. So we took something that was totally outside of her comfort zone. Mm -hmm. This was actually the first dress she tried on. This is by Karen Millen, only eighty four dollars, which is amazing. And it just ha does so much for her figure, and it's so many things she would have never worn. She said she didn't want to show her arms. She <laughs> thought she never could wear anything sleeveless. It's that's cutouts, and she looks stunning. Gorgeous, yes. guys. Yes. What do you think? Addie, okay. what do you I love think? it. Oh, <laughs> you look, by the way, you look so beautiful. Yes. I mean, inside out, the hair. Oh my God. It's, it's so on a lob. I love it. Yes. So Leona killed her hair. She did such a beautiful job. And Gia Makeup gave her a beautiful, natural, glowy look today. And it just all came together so beautifully. You look, how do you feel? Ugh. I just feel like so beautiful, like inside and out. And it's just. Like, I just feel very blessed. Mm, blessed cool. for the opportunity. And then just, I can't even, it's, I struggle to put it into words because it's very overwhelming. Like, when you, when your outside catches up with your inside. Yes. Wow. You are a true way, so well beauty. Said. You're inspiring well so many people, including your own family. Yeah. Look, um, we've got some flowers. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> That's from your husband. <laughs> yes. He purchased those. Um, Emily, um, we think you deserve to do a little more shopping. Yeah. So we are sending you home with a $500 gift card to spruce up <laughs> to your spruce wardrobe. Up wow. So maybe Melissa can help you. I know there were, you. first of all, you looked amazing in every dress you tried we on. We didn't ask your husband. What do you think of your beautiful wife? I think she looks, looks amazing. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Up next, another star today member revealing his new mindset after he committed to a better lifestyle. Later, one woman is going to share her fitness journey and the importance of non-scale victories. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This next community member can walk for miles. Six years ago, Nick Bricker's first 10-minute walk felt like a triathlon to him. But now, he walks about 12 miles a day. Now, that's impressive enough. But he's also lost over 200 pounds and has completely changed his lifestyle. Last summer, Nick stopped by the third hour to talk about his journey. When I became a father at age 40, I was heavy and only getting heavier. I was drinking 10,000 calories of beer a day and eating big late-night dinners. My weight stopped me from being active with my growing son. At my heaviest, I was north of 425 pounds. After years of resisting change, in 2018, I decided to quit drinking, but without other lifestyle changes, the weight stayed on. Two years later, I put the other pieces of the puzzle together, exercise and a healthier diet. 
At first, I couldn't last more than 10 minutes on my treadmill. Doctor said my lung capacity was at 30%. But with my son as my motivation, each day I walked a little further. After sharing my story in the Start Today group, it gave me a huge boost and a supportive community. Now, I haven't missed a day of walking in over three years. I'm proud to say I've lost 220 pounds, my lung capacity is back to 100%, and I'm the healthy father and husband I've always wanted to be. All right, so here's Nick a few years ago, and here's Nick there he is. now. Nick, come on out. Hey. Whoa. Oh, my wow. goodness. Dude. Hey. Hello. Way to go, Nick. Thank you. It's nice Congrats, to meet you. Nick. Thank you. Really nice Good to meet morning. you. Good morning. Congratulations. Thanks for coming Good in. Good brother. You Thanks right. for coming so in. Great. Have a sit down. Hey, yeah. so great, a great outfit, too. Well, yeah. Nice yeah. pop yeah. of color. Yeah. 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 Great. So, Nick, I, all of us who struggle with the, the weight that we've had, uh, there's a moment that says, you know what? I, I'm done. Enough is enough. It's either going to be one way or the other. i got to do something. What was it for you? You know, I just got tired of not being able to do anything. You know, I have my son and... You know, watching him grow up and being like, I, I can't do anything. You want to Look have a cat? Your your son? What's his name? His name's Ryland. And what's your wife's name? Liz. Hi, guys. Okay. Hi, guys. Hi, guys. <laughs> so, you know, I just got tired of saying, hey, you want to have a cat? You want to do this? No, no. Not because I didn't want to. Because yeah. physically, I you couldn't. couldn't. You no, couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah. So for so many people, the hardest part is getting started. But you actually say you have to start before you're even ready. What does that mean? So I know it's cliche. But it always says, I'll do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Until you decide that, that today is that tomorrow, it's never going to happen. Yeah. You just have to say, I'm going to do it, and do it, and stick to it. I read that you haven't milestone. missed walking in over three years. No, I mean, I walked five miles before I came on here this morning. Are you wow. serious? Yeah, I already got my 10,000 steps in. Wow. I already 1,000 do calories. Feel, do you feel like you have a new lease on life? Like I was reading, you know, you're surfing, golfing, skateboarding, like all the things perhaps that you couldn't do before. Are you kind of have a why not attitude now, huh? Yeah, you know, because when I was younger, you know, I was very active. Mm -hmm. Sur like you said, surfing, skateboarding, BMX riding. And in all those years, well, I, mean, I couldn't do you. anything. Look at uh, you. Yeah, wow. so, you know, it's kind of like I'm, I have a new lease on life, as you yeah. say, and I'm trying to pick up where I left off. Yeah. But I'm going to be honest with you, it's not like riding a bike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm 52 now, and when I was 24, I could jump on a skateboard. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's not like that anymore. And falling is a little different now. The funny thing was, you know, when I turned 50, I told my son, if I lose the weight, I'll ride BMX with you. So we were in Pittsburgh for a race. And I said, all right, let's do it. Long story short, I ended up in the trauma unit for two days. Ooh. Oh. No. Broken ribs, punctured oh. bones. Oh. Oh. So you got slow Maybe down stay in with a walk. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> walk yeah, walking safer. You, you mentioned your son, and we just showed a picture of him. We could show another one because they are just adorable. When you lost the weight, how did that change the relationship with, with your family? Well, obviously it changed it for the better because as a family, you like to do stuff as a unit. Yeah. And I was always the odd man out because mm -hmm. I couldn't be part of that unit I because heard. I physically couldn't. But now I can do whatever I want. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, d d talk next for me, the Start Today group on Facebook. What, what has that meant for you? You know... It was funny because I didn't really know about it until I saw it one day with the walking challenge. And I started reading into it. And I'm like, you know what? This is a, a great group. You know, I could share my story and hopefully, you know, other people we can connect. And, you know, if it helps one person, yeah. then it's, it's worth it. Yeah. And I go on there and I always check and, you know, reply. And it's just a, it's a great group. And the people in there seem to be very genuine and they're great. It's just yeah. an awesome thing. It's a terrific family. It's so yeah. good. Well, thank you. And Way so, to go. You. so yeah, glad your family's you. not doing great. That's fantastic. Yes, Nick, thank you so much. Coming up, we're going to meet two more members of our community to find out how they change their lives one step at a time and tips on how we can all do it, too. We're right back after these messages.
We're back with more Start Today. Now, we started this group a few years ago, and we cannot believe how much this community has grown. So many of our members sharing their stories with us, and we can't wait to introduce you to Melissa Palouche. What started off as a weight loss journey turned into so much more. While tracking her progress, she discovered the importance of non-scale victories, such as sleeping better, being able to walk up three flights of stairs without losing her breath. Let's take a look at Melissa's story and her advice to help others. I'm Melissa Palooch, a happily married mother of three. For most of my adulthood, I struggled with my weight. I avoided seeing a doctor for years because I didn't want to see the number on the scale. Finally, in June 2022, I got my blood work done and the results were not good. I was diagnosed with diabetes, high blood pressure, severe sleep apnea, and high cholesterol. At 43 years old, I was on more medication than my 83-year-old father. I woke up on July 1st last year and knew I had to make a change. So I switched up my diet and started counting calories. Reading posts on the Start Today Facebook page inspired me to exercise and I thought if others can do it, I can too. I started walking with my 18-year-old son and in eight weeks, I was able to walk a mile without getting winded. Now, one year later, I'm happy to announce I've lost 100 pounds and I feel incredible. All right, so here's a photo of Melissa on July 1st of last year. And here is Melissa now. Come on out. All right, Melissa. Yay, Melissa. Good morning. Congratulations. Oh, you, you look incredible. It. Thank How you. are you? Hi, Hi, welcome, you. welcome. Thank you. Hugs from afar. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there you go. All Congratulations. Right. You. Congratulations. Yeah. I mean, you. it's one thing to set a goal for yourself, yes. but it's another yes. to all of a sudden notice, hey, I think I'm going to reach this goal. Yes. How are you feeling? I feel amazing. I still I sometimes can't even believe that I did it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can't believe I did this, but I'm like, with I had the motivation, I had the perseverance, I was doing it. And I did it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Well, we heard you. Look at this picture. Isn't wow. this great? When you see that, what do you think? Oh, I can't even believe it. <laughs> I'm like, I still look to this day. Sometimes I still like look and I'm like, that's me. It's like, I can't even believe right. I did that. Like, you. I learned something from you because oh, I've never heard of an NSV. It means non-scale yes. victories. You celebrate those. Can you share some examples of what, of what that really means? Well, I can cross my legs again. Ah. Wow. <laughs> that's one. Um, I can paint my toes again, mm -hmm. which seems so silly. Mm -hmm. But my favorite one is that I'm actually exploring colors. As you can see in the picture, I'm wearing colors. Right. Where before I was always oh. wearing like shades of gray, oh, wow. black, navy blue. Mm -hmm. How special and now is I'm that? Like, nope, now my, my closet is colorful now. <laughs> and I love this green top you have. Yeah, yeah. another new one. <laughs> well, on this, on this journey, Melissa, I got to think, everybody who's been on this kind of journey, you, there's a certain point where you, you hit that plateau. Yes. And it can be very frustrating. No matter what you do, you just can't seem to break through. What, what's your advice? How, did you, how do you break those, 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 those moments? Uh, well, I hit two of them so far. And I did get discouraged at first, mm -hmm. but then I told myself, I'm like, you know what? You didn't come this far to go backwards again. So the first time I did it, I started drinking some more water. Mm -hmm. I figured, let me try that. That worked. It worked? It worked. As soon as I mm. added some more water to it, I started actually like picking up again just like that. Oh, I was wow. amazed, so that was really good. So I was excited. But in the past, that used to, that would deter me. Like as soon as mm -hmm. I hit a plateau, I'd be like, oh, well, Oh, well. yeah, not working. Right. It's not working anymore. I guess I'm supposed to be this way forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I would stop. Yeah. And I'm like, nope, not anymore. I'm going. like, now I'm like, I have to keep going. I have, if I want to be here, I have to. Yeah. So I'm like, I have no choice. We mentioned the colors in your wardrobe, which I think could be indicative of your mental health through this oh, whole yes. journey. How would you say you're feeling today compared to a year ago? So much happier. Hmm. I was actually saying that my husband told me the other day I have more pep. Hmm. And oh, I did man. before, and I was like, yep, I actually wake up in the morning, and I'm happy to get up in the morning. I'm yeah. not laying in bed because I don't want to get out of bed, mm -hmm. which is huge. Because I would lay there some days like, nope, don't even want to get up. Mm. I'm like, wow. I just want to stay here. Now I'm like, I want to do things. I look forward to getting up, and I look forward to walking mm -hmm. and, like, getting outside and doing things. So it's great. It's huge. You know, Al talked about this Start Today community so long ago, right? And it's been so rewarding to step back and watch all of you. It seems like you guys have really bonded in cities all over the country. I've made a ton of friends in that mm. group. I've never met them, but we've become social media friends. Oh, that's <laughs> cool. And I'm like, even today, they were all messaging me like, good luck. Oh. We're so happy for you. you inspire us and I'm like I feel like they're I honestly most of them feel like they're family to me mm -hmm. now That's like amazing. we've gotten very close so I'm like hopefully one day I can meet them but yeah. you know <laughs> so maybe there's somebody sitting at home right now Melissa who who's you know, had that problem and trying to get up and get out and get take those first steps because mm -hmm. you were there yeah what what would you say to that person watching right now 
to just get up and do it. I was walking mm -hmm. a half a mile for like two months, but you mm -hmm. know what? It was a half a mile more than what I was doing. Mm -hmm. That's all you can do. Do it. it doesn't matter. Any little bit of movement is important. So as long as you get up and move, yeah, it's better than nothing at all. And it's more than what you were doing the day before that. And the day before that is mm -hmm. the way I looked at it. And eventually, it's like you're going to get to whatever your goals are. It may take a while, but you'll get there. Yeah. How's it been for your family watching this for you? Good, very good. They're very mm -hmm. excited. Very, very excited. They're constantly telling me, like, you're a whole new person. We can't believe it. We're so happy for it's you. Incredible. Like, just the health changes alone have been huge. Because yeah. so. you can't be there for your family unless you're there for That's yourself. exactly right. what I told myself. I'm like, I have three kids. Like, if mm -hmm. I want to see them get married and maybe have kids one day, I'm like, I have to do something yeah, because it's not getting you, any better. You are such an inspiration. And thank so many you. people sitting at home now can look at you and it's like, okay, I can walk a half a mile today. Yes, yeah. so yeah, that's you. all you need to do just yeah. to get started. And it's not even thank, that. Just yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you so much thank for sharing you. your story. Just ahead, we are going to meet a dad of two to find out how an unexpected wake-up call changed his life. We'll be right back. We're back and continuing to highlight folks who have made incredible transformation. And this next guy is no exception. Back in 2021, Bayar Bayar Sekhan got an unexpected wake-up call when he received a life-threatening health diagnosis. As a dad of two young boys, Bayar decided to make a change. He started eating healthier and switched to a more active lifestyle. Since then, he has lost nearly half his body weight. Bayar visited our show last year to share his amazing transformation and how it actually inspired his kids. For most of my life, I've always been overweight. At my heaviest, I weighed 500 pounds. I often felt so tired that I would have to sit down to do the dishes or tell my kids that I was too exhausted to play with them. My wife would encourage me to start walking, but I lost interest in doing anything. In January 2021, I finally paid a visit to my doctor. I was diagnosed with a severe high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. And then he told me I was only expected to live until my 40s. That was the moment I knew I had to make a change. So I switched up my diet, but my biggest challenge was that I was addicted to sugar. I usually consumed about 200 grams of sugar a day. Over time, I learned how to control my portions, which slowly killed my cravings. I started walking, running, swimming, and eventually started strength training. Last summer, I even completed my first triathlon. Today, I have lost nearly half of my body weight, shedding 230 pounds in two years, and I have never felt better. Wow. This is quite the transformation. So we want to pull up this picture here. This was by our two years ago. Okay. And he's with us here. Here is Bayar now. We're here. Oh my goodness. Hi. Wow. Hi, look at you. Hey, hey. How are you? Thank you for coming. Hey, hey. Congratulations. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Hello. So nice to meet nice you and to have you here. Thank you for coming. Have a sit down. Thank you. Yes. So, I mean, you look great. I know. How are you feeling? Do you feel as great as you look? I definitely do. I mean, the feeling of it's it's actually amazing. And then wow. I want to share it. 
I yeah. love that. As you should, and you know, not just share it with your beautiful family, but to share it with everyone watching. So let's get into the nitty gritty here because you, you admitted in that spot that sugar was your weakness. You craved sugar, you couldn't give up sugar. So how were you able to curb that craving? Uh, I mean, it takes a time. It took me a definite a lot of days and years and months. I mean, months and years right now. Mm -hmm. um, I learned how to temper it down because as a, as a human being, you cannot just stop everything at the same time mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. because your, your brain is not actually meant to do that. Mm -hmm. So it takes time, but like I had to cut it little by little mm -hmm. and that's how it started. Yeah. So you went to the doctor initially, I read, or one of the reasons was because you were really tired all of the time. Was the weight affecting your sleep? Yes. So um, as, as I, I mean, what I was experiencing was like, I, I had to actually take naps. Hmm. My, my naps was not even regular naps. So like I had to take two hours. You were like naps. sleeping. I was like sleeping for yeah. two hours in the afternoons every hmm. single day, even at jobs on my chairs. Hmm. Wow. And then it was crazy. Mm -hmm. you, and you were someone who never exercised before. And then all of a sudden you, do, you start with the strength training and then I read that you actually competed in a triathlon. That's amazing. And, and now, is it true you're training for another one? Yes, yeah, so last year I did a nine mile, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. This year I'm doing it 32 miles. Wow. Goodness. Challenging myself. Wow. 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 When is that? Are you ready for it? August 27th. It's coming up. It's coming up, mm -hmm. so. I'm actually about to start my sessions soon. Wow. For wow. the training. Good for you. How old are your kids? I have a five and a nine year old. A five and a nine. So your kids old enough to understand what daddy has been through and his and oh, journey? Oh, they, they are so motivated by me that they are actually like doing something on their own right now, like mm. the push ups and stuff. Like oh. they see me doing it. Now they're mm -hmm. doing it on their own without even me telling them. You're that example for them. Yeah. Well, how would you say your mental health is tied into mm. your weight loss? Uh, it has definitely changed my life because when I was obese, I mean, I was morbidly obese. So when I was at this stage, I was lazy. I did not have motivation to do anything. Um, no short term, long term goals thinking about it. I just mm. learned to just live day to day. Mm. But now today, I'm like more motivated to do things and inspire and especially my mental health has been to the point where like even like in this simple task, like remembering things, it changes mm -hmm. lives. Because really? mm. when you're obese, your brain does not work the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. And you don't even remember things like for like your tasks. Mm -hmm. So even like simple like that. Wow. I love it. We talk a lot about health and wellness on this show, and I think for all of us, we all agree, it's not about the number on the scale, right? right? We know a lot of folks who, you know, our weight fluctuates or have you, but what would you say is the takeaway for people watching at home? It's more than just pounds, isn't it? It's more than just weight. It is definitely more than just the weights. Like, right now, I'm going through a situation where I'm shrinking, but the pounds are staying the same. So, mm. uh, I have learned that people are getting dismotivated by the scale. So mm. I would definitely tell people not to do that. Mm. Uh, I would like to motivate people just take the process, keep going, stay consistent with it, but definitely find your motivation. Mm -hmm. What motivates you? Uh, that's the key to yeah. it. Yeah. Well, well done, sir. I know. Yeah, well done. So proud. And I know your, your wife and kids are too. Yeah, yes. Right, thank you great. so much. That was good. A big thank you to our community members for sharing their stories with us. We hope this has inspired you to embrace your own health journey. And that wraps up this episode of Star Today. Don't forget, scan the QR code to sign up for our newsletter. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time on Today All Day. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, 
these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William France Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Ducky Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Ducky Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po'boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase, Jr. and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Ducky Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china, she wanted linens, she wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution, years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace but that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall, the list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time, they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, 
passing away on June 1, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades, from red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la dookie. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter Four. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. Exactly. It's great right. to enjoy everything. Good. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase, Chase to, to get, get myself my some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, 
It was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner, Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Kalepsi, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. It's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's had. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, yeah. See how gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to. I'm gonna try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow, that looks perfect. Now this now is you're what, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're person. For. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, it's moist, crisp. Oh, your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I can come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and um, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ain't here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come to the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is here to show us how to turn an easy sheet pan recipe into the ultimate reboot bowl. Good morning, Joy. Good morning, Joy. Good morning, guys. Lindsay, it's so nice to be here with you. you the too. last time we were together, I think we were having a vegetarian feast oh, in Connecticut, yes. right? We were at the right. tavern. That's, That's right. Yes. That's right. So I'm going to show you how to transform the easiest one sheet recipe into an energizing reboot bowl that has literally layers and layers of yummy goodness. But the best part, it is very, very simple to put together. So I'm gonna start with the sheet, rest, the sheet pan recipe. Here I have three heaping cups of broccoli. So the, the, the big uh, theme here is gonna be lots of plants. This is three heaping cups of uh, sweet potato that I cubed, or you can ap absolutely use any kind of acorn or winter squash as well. And now I have more cruciferous vegetables, so loads of fiber, and that is our cauliflorets. Now I have one can of rinsed and drained, and very important, it's padded dry chickpeas because I'm adding in a lot of fiber and some protein now. A little bit of olive oil. I have about two to three tablespoons in here because I want all the seasonings to stick. Now, I like to over season. So I'm going to put in, th uh, this is two teaspoons of garlic powder and two teaspoons of onion powder. And I had some fresh rosemary in my fridge. So I chopped up and I have about two tablespoons here. But it's eater's choice. You can put in whatever herbs that you want. And you're just going to mix this up mm -hmm. to evenly distribute everything. You pour it onto your sheet pan. I mist it with a little bit of olive oil spray. And then I just put this. Actually, I'm going to add a little bit of salt and pepper. I, I forgot about my salt and pepper. Mm -hmm. But it goes in the oven, set at 425 on the middle rack, just for about 30 to 35 minutes. And I flip it halfway through. And I'm going to show you what it looks like because you are going to get these gorgeous char marks. Look at this. Oh. This just came out of the oven. Do you, can oh, you see great. this? Let me say. So when you're building the yeah. bowl, Joy, what layer goes first? Okay. So now for the fun part. 
and you are the boss of your bowl because there's so many different directions that you can customize this bowl. So here's my bowl. Mm -hmm. And the first layer is going to be dark leafy greens. Mm -hmm. So it could be spinach, kale, it could be any lettuce that you want. Oh. The next is going to be a heaping mound of those delicious, caramelized, addictive veggies mm -hmm. that we roasted. Mm -hmm. Then a little bit of fruit. So I'm oh. using the pear because I don't think pear gets enough love, guys. And it actually has a little bit more fiber than apples. Oh, but you that. can also use an apple. Mm -hmm. You could also use pomegranate seeds or um, even uh, dried cranberries right. or cherries. Anything goes. And then the protein is your choice. So wow. I put out a question on Instagram earlier this morning. And I asked my followers, what should I put on? Lentils, salmon, black beans, shrimp. I have chicken. I have tofu. I'm going to tell you the tofu came in last place. <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and go for the salmon this time. And last but not least, we have this mellow. Her the salmon to put in the leafy yeah. bowl. <laughs> and we have a mellow but mouth-watering tahini dressing that I'm going to show you how to make because everybody needs this. We're not going to have time We're going to put that. that on the website. We'll put it on the website. But okay, thank you, you so much. It. That looks fantastic. Look, All right. Look at this. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a drizzle Beauty. because you got to oh, see this. Drizzle. And for this recipe, <laughs> head to today.com. <laughs> Today nutritionist Joy Bowers here joining us with a corn chowder and a spiced chai tea. Mm, Good let's morning, start cooking. Joy. Good morning. Oh, my people. Hey, guys. So today is all about warming the bones with okay. healthy foods and beverages. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we're going to make is, like you mentioned, a cozy, creamy corn chowder. And I'm telling you, this is scrumptiously slurpable. Mm. I'm going to take you over to my stove. Okay. So here um, I have what I'm calling my nutrition confetti. All I've done is I sauteed some carrots, celery, and onions. It mm -hmm. kind of looks like confetti, doesn't Carrot, it? Celery, onions. Okay. okay. Um, and, and now we build the soup. It's as easy as that. Because corn is not in season, I'm taking advantage of canned corn actually for a few reasons. One is because I get to use it. You notice I didn't drain it. The juice, I, yeah. I'm using the flavorful broth that normally oh. we just discard. Mm -hmm. I'm putting two cans in there. Then I'm putting in a full um, four cups of either a vegetable broth or a chicken broth. What did you and use there? I would, I'm using, uh, this is a chicken broth, and I'm using a reduced sodium because I'm controlling the salt. Okay. So there we have that. And then just a little bit of cayenne because it really does give it a pop of flavor. Okay. And then last, one pound of small red potatoes. I leave the skin on for extra fiber. And um, I cut them up into bite-sized pieces right. because I'm going to put a lid on this. I'm going to simmer it for about 15 minutes just until those potatoes get fork tender. Okay. I'm going to put this over here, and then the fun begins. I want a lot of body in this soup, so I use an immersion blender. But you can also do this in um, small batches in either a food processor or that, a regular yeah. blender. Okay. And see what I'm doing there? I'm just yeah. blending it so they get a lot of richness and body within that soup. And if anybody doesn't have a blender right. or an immersion blender, you can leave it chunky. It's totally mm -hmm. okay. It's so good. now, yeah, it's really good. You could stop right there, but right. we're not going to stop. Oh, right? no, so then not. to finish it off, more no texture, corn. I'm mm -hmm. adding in drained corn. So this time it's two cans of drained mm -hmm. corn. Because I saw all these and, like, whole corn kernels in there. I was wondering when they Yes. Were. And before I actually pureed the whole thing, mm -hmm. I like to reserve some of the potatoes, so again, for a little bit of texture and, mm -hmm. like, surprises as you slurp through. That's really good. And yeah. a dash of salt, and it makes a great big batch. And I like to Very garnish simple. it with Isn't a little really bit terrific? of dill. It's really good, Joy. How about the tea, Joy? Yeah, we'll try that. that. The chai tea? This is fantastic. The chai tea. So here we go. I put mm. four cups of water in here. I love chai because my kitchen smells so unbelievably right now. It really infuses it with such aroma. And in the four cups of water, my combination is some cinnamon sticks, ginger, a little bit of nutmeg, fennel, peppercorns, oh. cloves, and cardamom. Okay. And I give you a recipe for a balanced base, but really you could ramp up any of these spices if you like a stronger flavor. And so as those were um, 
uh, simmering in here for about 15 minutes. Then you put in your tea. So I have four tea bags that I added in. They've been in here for just about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Stick this over here. And now we build it. I add in three to four cups of the milk. Truth be told, I tried this with an almond milk, and it came out a little bit too thin, so I'm yeah. using a 2% reduced fat. Okay. And Maybe an oat a milk. Little I was going to ask you about oat milk, yeah. Oat milk would be fabulous. And this is a little bit of vanilla and a little bit of honey. And then I'm going to bring mm. you over mm. to my finished product. Come back with me over okay. here. I'm and sure it smells good, here, yeah. Can't I well, strain it through a colander, <laughs> and here's the cool part. I feel like if you're going to be putting in so much effort, because it's much more involved than just steeping regular tea, mm -hmm. I make a great big batch, and then I stash it in the fridge, and whenever a craving calls, mm -hmm. I just warm it in the microwave, Very and you nice. have about seven cups. All right, Joy. Mm -hmm. well, thank you much. We're, we are ready for the weekend. I know, thank cozy. You. Yummy, we yummy, yummy. It. Thank you, Joy. Joy Bauer is upgrading our lunchtime with two, not one, but two tasty sandwiches that she makes in a skillet. Hey, good morning, Joy. Hey, hey Joy. Joy. Hey. Good morning, guys. I think I'm about to become your new favorite lunch lady because we are <laughs> seriously creating next level sandwiches. And like you said, in the skillet. So the first sandwich is a fun spin on a traditional and beloved PB&J, mm -hmm. but I'm calling this one a grilled PB and fruit. So here I have hearty, seedy, whole grain bread. We're actually making two because I want to show you the versatility of the fruit. Mm -hmm. And I just put a tablespoon of peanut butter on all of the slices. So you want this peanut butter going on the bottom slice and the top slice. And then you become the Picasso of your decor, right? So I have all this fruit over here. The cool thing is when you don't use sugary jam and you use the whole fruit, you're getting a lot of texture, you're getting a lot of hardiness, and you're getting the vitamins, the minerals, the antioxidants that the fruit brings to the table. Um, you could stick with one fruit. A lot of people just like PB and bananas, oh, yeah. or you could yep. do what I've done. And when you see the great Grapes over here, I did slice them in half. I just want to show you because mm -hmm. otherwise they would be they a little around. bit too bulky. <laughs> exactly. So then what you do, I'll show you on one. You take your top slice mm -hmm. and you put it over your Sammy and you take olive oil spray and give it a nice liberal spray okay. on both Instead sides. Instead of butter. Instead of butter, exactly. And this goes in the skillet just for one minute on either side. And I'm going to show you what it looks like because you can't believe how easy it is. Oh, wow. Jill, what I happens Joy, is you could do this. <laughs> and Joy, by the way, the production values, camera's moving, you got an overhead camera. It's uh, uh, unbelievable. She's never coming back to the studio that, to bring us any of this food. That Ian Bauer <laughs> is a superstar husband and photographer. Yeah. And, and I keep saying, like, he needs a, a, a like, a, what, what would we call it, a, a COVID Emmy or something like that. He has learned how to do all of this. Well, I'm, High five for I'm Ian sending for him sure. that. And I think you need an Emmy, too, because you're actually going to show us how to make a sandwich that I never thought you can make healthier, a Monte Cristo. Mm. Oh, my goodness. This has so many layers of scrumptiousness. So 
what I'm starting with here. So these, this is whole grain bread also, but for mm. this one, because it has a French toast melt in your mouth feel, mm -hmm. you want a softer bread. So it's a whole grain softer bread. I put mm. Dijon mustard on one slice and let the layering begin. So we have here, I'm using ham because that's classic, but truth be told, you I don't to love ham. Out. <laughs> I had some extra here. Now, normally they top the French toast with some powdered sugar. So instead for a little sweet something, I put in a crisp Fuji apple. Mm. Then we have our Swiss cheese on top. Take the second piece that. of bread, so but because we're melting. making French toast, we have here an egg mixed with a little bit of vanilla extract oh, whoa. and a dash of milk. That looks this really. And how long does in that go into the, the griddle? Skillet, about four minutes, I'm going to grab it. About four minutes on each side, and you cannot Whoa. believe this that is just yummy. like a masterpiece. Let me see if I can get a close-up. Yeah. I'm going to grab through the screen, that, Joy. That is fantastic, Joy. Thank you so much. <laughs> we appreciate it. And for you these recipes it. and more, head to today.com slash food. Today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is ripping up a barbecue salmon bowl mm. packed with flavor and nutrients. Good morning to you. Hey, Joy. Good morning, guys. So nice to see you. You too. too. Well, before we dig in here, can you talk about some good superfoods that all of us can incorporate um, into our diets? Definitely. So I put together a list of five superfoods. I mean, these are some of the best of the best foods that everyone should be eating, but I specifically designed this list for women. And the okay. first one is spinach. Spinach is basically nature's multivitamin. When I tell you it has countless, countless vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and fiber. But interestingly enough, it has a unique combination of two potent antioxidants called lutein and zeaxanthin that help to promote sharp vision. And also, it's a great source of plant-based iron, which helps us to maintain our energy levels. The next on the list is salmon. I mean, this tops every single list. It has a lot of high quality protein. It also has all the essential amino acids. So that means it helps us to maintain our muscle mass. And as we get older, it keeps our metabolism revved. But of course, salmon is world famous for its omega-3 fats. And omega-3 fats are super important because first, they tame inflammation in the body. They also support heart health. They help to drive down triglycerides and they manage blood pressure. But they also help to regulate your mood. And one other thing I'm going to say about salmon, I could talk about salmon all day. But we don't, we don't have all day, Joyce. We got we to gotta move on here. So how are we going to start combining all these things? Well, three other foods we have are beans, we have for skin health, our tomatoes, and last but not least, 
I'm touting almonds. All almond, all nuts are winners, but almonds have the added bonus of calcium. So okay. I'm going to take all of these foods and we're going to turn it into kind of like a boss lady bowl. This is okay. a barbecue salmon bowl that has everything. Okay. While so you're throwing I this all together, Joy, I still want to know what you were going to say about salmon. <laughs> Salmon has vitamin D, and vitamin okay. D helps to keep our immune system strong. There you go. And okay. also helps with bones, healthy bones and teeth. So okay. here we have all of our spinach, and I chopped this spinach up because it works better in the bowl. Okay. And now we take our award-winning salmon. That's salmon. And this salmon is, a little, is delicious. Is it just salt and, and pepper on there? Salt and pepper and extra virgin olive oil. That's mm. it. And you mash it right up. It's the easiest thing. And you could do this with leftover salmon as well. So you already know that this bowl is packed with the good stuff. Now I'm adding in my beans. Before, what I was going to say about beans, they have a great combination of plant-based protein and fiber, which steadies your blood sugar levels. Mm -hmm. Now we have our tomatoes. Tomatoes have lycopene and vitamin C, which protects our skin from the sun's harmful rays. This is just some extras because we want to make this bowl extra delicious. We've got some corn, Colorful super healthy. Too. Look at the um, the pop of color from the red onion. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, actually, I'm going to squeeze on a little bit of lime juice. Mm -hmm. And you could add a little bit of cumin or salt and pepper if you want. And here comes the barbecue sauce because this is a Wait, we're barbecue, to have barbecue salmon sauce? bowl. You can. And there's a lot of great brands that are lower in sugar, but you're only using about two to three tablespoons. Okay. And this is instead of dressing. Now, it's almost complete, but there was one last superfood that I touted, and that the was almonds? the almonds. Mm. So I'm going to add in mm. a sprinkle of almonds for some crunch. crunch. And I love, sca whoops, I love scallions. And guys, this is a sausage. That and that's one serving? It's no. One <laughs> Serving. No, no it's it one is. serving. That's one and serving. It's packed with oh, we thought you were just... and fiber. That's amazing. Yeah. No, guys, fill you up for a I while. Mean, yeah, this is uh, really yeah. good stuff. Joy Bauer is here with two dinner recipes. That, that Joy, they, we're just using one pan, right? One pan. It's Forget officially about all those bowls. cheap. No, she pan <laughs> superfood Friday. And again, it is, there's so much to love about these recipes because like you said, Craig, they're easy to make, they're packed with nutrition and they're totally delicious. And we're starting with what I'm calling a sheet pan harissa salmon with vegetables. And step one is to roast those vegetables. So in the spirit of convenience, I'm using baby carrots. They're already cut and washed for you. And here, some cauliflower mm. florets, nice. a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, and a little bit of salt and pepper, and that's it. Now, I'm going to mix this up. I preset the oven for 450. These are hearty vegetables, and I'm going to lay them out on my baking sheet in a single file. And Joy, how do you make sure you don't burn the vegetables when you're roasting at such high heat? So I definitely keep a watch on them, but for these, I put them in for about 25 minutes, and I like to make sure that the carrots are fork tender. Again, mm -hmm. they're hearty, so they take a little bit of a little bit in that oven on high mm -hmm. heat. And I like that cauliflower to get oh, charred oh, and slightly so burnt good. on top. It's like melt in your mm -hmm. mouth. It makes you scream for another bite. Now, <laughs> while these are in the oven, we're gonna do the magic sauce. So what happens here is in a bowl, I mix. Harissa is a chili paste. It's from, it's Middle Eastern and it's North African. And it has olive oil and a whole lot of warm, wonderful spices. I added some sweet citrus orange juice to sort of make it pop and a little bit of ground ginger. And I just mix this up. And again, guys, this is while the veggies are roasting in the oven. Now you take your salmon fillets and upside down, if you do have the skin on, you just sort of dunk it in, submerge it in that bowl and let them sit and marinate and soak up all the mm. yummy sauce while the veggies are in. Then when the veggies come out, you nestle the salmon nestle. slices, mm. uh, nestle this in between delicious. the veggies. Right? And you want to make sure that they're touching the heated pan. So get all four of those fillets in. Whoops, I did that upside down, Joy. I was going to say, <laughs> wait, which way are we putting? All right, so skin side no. down. Skin side down. Or you could also buy fillets that don't have the skin, whichever mm -hmm. you prefer. Oh, and then the remaining sauce goes on top. And then this goes back in the oven again on 450. Keep the heat going for just 
10 minutes Ooh. and then you put some herbs on top and you got that yourself a party. Wow. That's wow. all there is to it. Now you got a cheesy one it. for us, right? Okay, so now we're gonna change directions, guys. We are making a sheet pan baked feta sausage and veggies. I needed mm, to jump on this trend. Everybody's talking about the baked feta yes. now. And this time I'm using very different vegetables. So these kind of screen summer. I have beautiful, vibrant tomatoes. I have sweet kernels of corn. I use canned corn. Mm -hmm. It works with frozen too. But corn. if you have fresh corn, of course. And we have some uh, zucchini, a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. This time I'm adding in ground cumin and some crushed red pepper flakes, some lime slices, oh. and a little bit of salt. So this also will get all stirred up. It's gonna go on your baking sheet. This goes in the oven. These are a little bit more delicate, these vegetables. So the oven is set at 425 just for 20 minutes. Then you take it out and you're gonna put in pre-cooked sliced poultry sausage. Again, nestle it right in <laughs> with the vegetables. And then sticks of feta. You're gonna, mm. there, there goes my sausage. And there's all types of pre-cooked varieties at the market. Mm -hmm. And I buy the block feta cut it into strips. It never melts no. in the oven, but it sort of becomes softer and spreadable. Mm. And guys, I'm telling you, you take this out, you give it a squeeze with fresh lime juice oh, and some fantastic. herbs. And if you could get a bite with all three, the feta, the vegetables, and mm. the sausage, that looks you are, amazing. Mm. Well, you enjoy halloumi so cheese would be probably great with that too. Mm. Wow, Al, that would be super. Oh, it's, a, it's a Greek grilling cheese. Oh. So, Joy, you... thank you. Joy, that was awesome. You thank you it. so much. Have a great weekend, Joy. Ooh, I want all bye of bye, that. Guys. Folks, for those recipes, it's very simple. Today.com slash food. good pal today nutritionist joy bauer back with two easy delicious ways to dress up a simple piece of toast mm. <clears throat> happy new year everyone today i am toasting a healthier 2021 with two scrumptious spins on toast first an addictive chocolate peanut butter spread the secret ingredient is this peanut powder and you can find this in uh, the grocery store or you could order it online and it is packed with protein. Next, cocoa powder which is filled with brain boosting flavonoids, some sugar and a pinch of salt. And then I'm gonna add six to eight tablespoons of water and this is going to mix together to create the creamiest, dreamiest chocolate peanut butter spread. Just keep stirring and look at this, guys. It transforms into a delicious, lick the spoon, addictive spread. And now we are ready to build our toast. Putting a nice, generous amount of my chocolate peanut butter spread right on the toast. I'm gonna top it with potassium packed bananas. 
And really, you could put whatever fruit you want on top. And of course, the bananas have potassium, they have fiber. And on this slice, I'm also gonna add some vitamin C rich strawberries for extra flavor and extra nutrition. And the best part, guys, there is so much chocolate peanut butter sauce left over for dipping. <laughs> And now for some savory satisfaction, caprese toast. It's a classic combo that is completely customizable. And I'm starting with the bottom base of mashed avocado. And avocado is great because it's loaded with heart healthy fat, it's got potassium, and it's got a lot of fiber too. So I'm just mashing this down as our first layer. And you probably know what comes next. Lycopene rich tomatoes. They also have vitamin C, which boosts the immune system. And I'm putting on mozzarella, which adds some calcium. And last but not least, just some torn basil leaves, which makes the kitchen smell so good. This is one layered tower of deliciousness. But one more thing. I like to drizzle on a balsamic glaze right over the top. And if you can't find balsamic glaze, you could also take regular balsamic vinegar and you can reduce it in a small saucepan over a low heat for about 10, 20 minutes and it will thicken right up. And that's what I call a toast to a healthy 2021. Mm. Welcome to today all day. All day? Today all day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking yeah, who's your okay. favorite character you've ever played? Oh, the right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> what is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice things. Yeah, she gave me the, the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. <laughs> when I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy Cal. Cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today. With simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit <laughs> now. How wow. good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. One of our most favorite yes. franchises ever, wow. Ambush Makeovers. Okay. Look at it. It doesn't, it doesn't look so good. No, it doesn't look good. Okay. Will you judge okay. us in a cook-off? I yes. will, and okay. you guys will definitely win something. Today, all day. All day? All day. Welcome to Today, All Day. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Start Today. Now, I got to tell you, there's nothing like the beginning of a fresh new year. Whether you're a seasoned member or you're just joining us for the first time, there is a place for everybody in our Start Today community. We've got over a half million members. Come on! Never too late to join in. Scan the QR code to subscribe to our newsletter and get the jump start to improve your health. And what better way to kick off the new year than highlighting some of our community members? On this special episode, we're going to introduce you to four folks who have made huge strides in their fitness journey. So let's get to it. This is Start Today. First up, we're going to begin with Emily Baker. A few years ago, she took control of her health and she started running for 15 seconds at a time. Those 15 seconds eventually turned into 26.2 miles when she completed the New York City Marathon in 2022. Hoda and Jenna heard about Emily's story from our Start Today group and helped her celebrate her milestone with a style makeover. Now, before we see Emily's transformation, let's hear her story. I am Emily Conley Baker. I am 34 years old and I am a mother of three, a health and wellness coach, and I'm a registered pediatric nurse. I've always been someone who put on this face every day that I had everything together, but inside I really struggled emotionally, specifically surrounding my weight and my physical appearance. In 2019, I had my youngest. About three weeks later, my father passed away visiting us. His size was a massive comorbidity of his, and ultimately it didn't allow him to 
effectively get the care he needed. So witnessing that tremendous loss really just sat with me. I was on the phone with my two brothers. And my brother said to me, Emily, I know you don't feel like physically you're at rock bottom, but emotionally, I think you're there. I'm so thankful they said that to me because I, for the first time, recognized that rock bottom didn't have to be about what I looked like physically. In May of 2021, Emily underwent a vertical sleeve gastrectomy. I knew that it was like my one shot to get this right. And for my 33rd birthday, I decided I was gonna run 3.3 miles. I would start running 15 seconds at a time. Started just building up little by little by little. Emily joined a running club and became part of the Start Today community. I like couldn't get enough of it because it was just people exactly like me. It kind of lights a spark within you. And you have this moment of like, wow, they've made themselves and their movement a priority today. I want to go and do that for myself. The Queens, New York resident ran a half marathon in March of 2022, and just nine months later completed the New York City Marathon. She is now a certified run instructor, a certified personal trainer, and has lost 135 pounds to date. I couldn't have done any of this alone without my family and without the community that I created as well. When I think about all of this change, I think about my children. I have a nine-year-old. I don't think she recognizes how much of a driving force she's been for me. I'm very proud of how far I've come on the inside, emotionally, physically, but I want to portray that with my style. Emily's so nice to meet you. Inter style so expert, so Melissa talk. Garcia. So tell me a little bit about what your personal style is currently right now. I struggle in the style department. I'm either in my nursing scrubs or I am in active wear. At the end of this, how do you want to walk out and feel? I feel so much pride and confidence in my ability to change drastically. So I want people to see that in, in what I'm wearing. I am so excited. Let's get started and start trying some clothes on. Oh, wow. Yes. When she found the winning look, it was off to the salon. Welcome Hi. to LW Salon. Uh, thank you. They're gonna make you over so it's a minimum, but still fabulous. Okay, we took some inches off your hair. Now it's time to get to work. Are you ready for your new look? I am. Okay, let's go. And we are oh, so let's go, let's go. Lucky because we are joined by Emily's family, her husband Nick, her kids Adeline, Flynn, and Cora and her running coach, Michelle Ray. What a beautiful mom you guys have. What an amazing wife. Um, are you guys anxious to see her? Yes. Are you sure? Are you all excited? <laughs> okay, because she looked great before. I can't imagine how cool she's gonna I look know. now. Okay, so should we look at Emily's before picture? Okay. And can we see Emily's new look? Come on out, Emily! <laughs> wow! Oh my gosh, I, Melissa, this dress. Ridiculous, right? <laughs> Your husband. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Melissa, why, why'd you choose it? Okay, so oh, first of all, it was such an honor to work with you, Emily. Oh. Like I had, you were, you were a blessing to me. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we talked and she said she wanted to feel confident. She wanted her mind to catch up with her body. She said she didn't feel like they were together in yeah. sync. So we took something that was totally outside of her comfort zone. Mm -hmm. This was actually the first dress she tried on. This is by Karen Millen, only $84, which is amazing. And it just does so much for her figure. And it's so many things she would have never worn. She said she didn't want to show her arms. She <laughs> thought she never could wear anything sleeveless. It says cutouts. And she looks stunning. Gorgeous. Yes. Guys, yeah. what do you think? Addie, okay. what do you I love think? it. Oh, <laughs> you look, by the way, you look so beautiful. Yes. I mean, inside out, the hair. Oh my God. It's, it's so on A lob, I love it. Yes, yeah. so Leona killed her hair. She did such a beautiful job and Gia Makeup gave her a beautiful, natural, glowy look today. And it just all came together so beautifully. You look, how do you feel? Ugh. I just feel like so beautiful, like inside and out. And it's just, like, I just feel very blessed. Mm -hmm. Blessed for the opportunity. And then just 
I can't even, it's, I struggle to put it into words because it's very overwhelming. Like when you, when your outside catches up with your inside. Yes. Wow. You are a Otherwise, true so well beauty. Said. You're inspiring well so well. many people, including your own family. Yeah. Look, um, we've got some flowers. Oh, yeah. For you. Oh. <laughs> That's from your husband. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he purchased those. Um, Emily, um, we think you deserve to do a little more shopping. Yeah. So we are sending you home with a $500 gift card to spruce up <laughs> your spruce wardrobe. Up wow. So maybe Melissa can help you. I know there were, you. first of all, you looked amazing in every dress you tried we on. We didn't ask your husband, what do you think of your beautiful wife? I think she looks amazing. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes. Up next, another star today member revealing his new mindset after he committed to a better lifestyle. Later, one woman is going to share her fitness journey and the importance of non-scale victories. We'll be right back. And welcome back. This next community member can walk for miles. Six years ago, Nick Bricker's first 10-minute walk felt like a triathlon to him, but now he walks about 12 miles a day. Now, that's impressive enough, but he's also lost over 200 pounds and has completely changed his lifestyle. Last summer, Nick stopped by the third hour to talk about his journey. When I became a father at age 40, I was heavy and only getting heavier. I was drinking 10,000 calories of beer a day, and eating big late night dinners. My weight stopped me from being active with my growing son. At my heaviest, I was north of 425 pounds. After years of resisting change, in 2018, I decided to quit drinking, but without other lifestyle changes, the weight stayed on. Two years later, I put the other pieces of the puzzle together, exercise and a healthier diet. At first, I couldn't last more than 10 minutes on my treadmill. Doctors said my lung capacity was at 30%. But with my son as my motivation, each day I walked a little further. After sharing my story in the Start Today group, it gave me a huge boost and a supportive community. Now, I haven't missed a day of walking in over three years. I'm proud to say I've lost 220 pounds, my lung capacity is back to 100%, and I'm the healthy father and husband I've always wanted to be. All right, so here's Nick a few years ago. And here's Nick. There he is. Now, Nick, come on out. Yay. Whoa. Oh, my wow. goodness. Dude. Hello. Way to go, Nick. Congratulations. Thank you. It's nice Congrats, to meet you. Nick. Thank you. Really nice Good to morning. meet you. Good morning. Thanks for nice coming in. Nice to meet you, brother. Oh, Thanks right. for coming so in. Great. Have a sit down. Hey, yeah. so, a great, a great outfit, too. Well, yeah. Nice pop of color. Yeah. yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, Nick, I, all of us who struggle with the, the weight that we've had, uh, there's a moment that says, you know what? I, I'm done. Enough is enough. It's either going to be one way or the other. i got to do something. What was it for you? You know, I just got tired of not being able to do anything. You know, I have my son and, you know, watching him grow up and being like, I, I can't do anything. You want to have a cat? Your your son? What's his name? His name's Ryland. And what's your wife's name? Liz. Hi, okay. guys. Hi, guys. <laughs> so, you know, I just got tired of saying, hey, you want to have a cat? You want to do this? No, no. Not because I didn't want to, because yeah. physically I you couldn't. couldn't. You no, couldn't. I couldn't. Yeah. So for so many people, the hardest part is getting started. But you actually say you have to start before you're even ready. What does that mean? So 
I know it's cliche, but I always says, I'll do it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. wow. Until you decide that, that today is that tomorrow, it's never going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to say, I'm going to do it and do it and stick to it. I read that you haven't milestone. missed walking in over three years. No, I mean, I walked five miles before I came on here this morning. Are you Whoa. serious? Yeah, I've already got my 10,000 steps in. Wow. I already burned 1,000 calories. Do you feel like you have a new lease on life? Like I was reading, you know, you're surfing, golfing, skateboarding, like all the things perhaps that you couldn't do before. Are you kind of have a why not attitude now, huh? Yeah, you know, because when I was younger, you know, I was very active. Mm -hmm. so, like you said, surfing, skateboarding, BMX riding. And in all those years... I, mean, well, I couldn't do you. anything. Look at wow. you. Yeah, wow. so, you know, it's kind of like I'm, I have a new lease on life, as you yeah. say, and I'm trying to pick up where I left off. Yeah. But I'm going to be honest with you. It's not like riding a bike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm 52 now, and <laughs> when I was 24, I could jump on a skateboard. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's not like that more. anymore. And falling yeah. is a little different now. The funny yeah. thing was, you know, when I turned 50, I told my son, if I lose a weight, I'll ride BMX with you. So we were in Pittsburgh for a race, and I said, all right, let's do it. Long story short. I ended up in the trauma unit for two days. Ooh. Oh, no. Broken ribs, punctured oh, bones. Yeah. Oh, Lord. Oh. So you got to slow Maybe down. Maybe stay there with a walk. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> walking walk. yeah, safer. Walk you, you mentioned your son, and we just showed a picture of him. We could show another one because they are just adorable. When you lost the weight, how did that change the relationship with, with your family? Well, obviously it changed it for the better because as a family, you like to do stuff as a unit. Yeah. Right? And I was always the odd man out because mm -hmm. I couldn't be part of that unit because I, I physically couldn't. But now I can do whatever I want. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, d d talk next for me, the Start Today group on Facebook. What, what has that meant for you? You know, it was funny because I didn't really know about it until I saw it one day with the walking challenge. And I started reading into it. I'm like, you know what, this is a, a great group. Yeah. You know, I could share my story and hopefully, you know, other people we can connect and you know, if it helps one person, yeah. then it's, it's worth it. Yeah. And I go on there and I always check and, you know, reply. And it's just a, it's a great group. And the people in there seem to be very genuine and they're great. It's just yeah. an awesome thing. It's a terrific family. Oh, it's so yeah. good. Well, thank you. And Way so, to go. So, you. so yeah, glad your family's not doing great. That's fantastic. Yeah, Nick, so thank you so much. Coming up, we're going to meet two more members of our community to find out how they change their lives one step at a time and tips on how we can all do it, too. We're right back after these messages. We're back with more Start Today. Now, we started this group a few years ago, and we cannot believe how much this community has grown. So many of our members sharing their stories with us, and we can't wait to introduce you to Melissa Palouche. What started off as a weight loss journey 
turned into so much more. While tracking her progress, she discovered the importance of non-scale victories, such as sleeping better, being able to walk up three flights of stairs without losing her breath. Let's take a look at Melissa's story and her advice to help others. I'm Melissa Palooch, a happily married mother of three. For most of my adulthood, I struggled with my weight. I avoided seeing a doctor for years because I didn't want to see the number on the scale. Finally, in June 2022, I got my blood work done and the results were not good. I was diagnosed with diabetes, high blood pressure, severe sleep apnea, and high cholesterol. At 43 years old, I was on more medication than my 83-year-old father. I woke up on July 1st last year and knew I had to make a change. So I switched up my diet and started counting calories. Reading posts on the Start Today Facebook page inspired me to exercise and I thought if others can do it, I can too. I started walking with my 18-year-old son and in eight weeks, I was able to walk a mile without getting winded. Now, one year later, I'm happy to announce I've lost 100 pounds and I feel incredible. All right, so here's a photo of Melissa on July 1st of last year. And here is Melissa now. Come on out. All right, Melissa. Yay, Melissa. Good morning. Congratulations. Oh, you, you look incredible. It. Thank How you. are you? Hi, welcome, you. welcome. Thank you. Hugs from afar. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there you go. Oh, Congratulations. You. Congratulations. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's one thing to set a goal for yourself, yeah. but it's another yeah. to all of a sudden notice, hey, I think I'm going to reach this goal. Yes. How are you feeling? I feel amazing. I still I sometimes can't even believe that I did it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I can't believe I did this, but I'm like, with I had the motivation, I had the perseverance, I was doing it. And I did it. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Well, we heard you. Look at this picture. Isn't wow. this great? When you see that, what do you think? Oh, I can't even believe it. I'm <laughs> like, I still look to this day. Sometimes I still like look and I'm like, that's me. It's like, I can't even right. believe I did that. I, like, <laughs> I learned something from you because oh, I've never heard of an NSV. It means non-scale yes. victories. You celebrate those. Can you share some examples of what, of what that really means? Well, I can cross my legs again. Ah. Wow. <laughs> that's one. Um, I can paint my toes again, mm -hmm. which seems so silly. Mm -hmm. But my favorite one is that I'm actually exploring colors. As you can see in the picture, I'm wearing colors. Mm -hmm. right. Or before I was always wearing like shades of gray, oh, wow. black, navy blue. Mm -hmm. How special and now is I'm that? Like, nope, now my, my closet is colorful now. <laughs> and I love this green top you have. Yeah, yeah. another new one. <laughs> well, on this, on this journey, Melissa, I got to think, everybody who's been on this kind of journey, you, there's a certain point where you, you hit that plateau. Yes. And it can be very frustrating. No matter what you do, you just can't seem to break through. What, what's your advice? How, did you, how do you break those, 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 those moments? Uh, well, I hit two of them so far. And I did get discouraged at first, mm -hmm. but then I told myself, I'm like, you know what? You didn't come this far to go backwards again. So the first time I did it, I started drinking some more water. Mm -hmm. I figured, let me try that. That worked. It worked? It worked. As soon as mm -hmm. I added some more water to it, I started actually like picking up again just like that. Oh, I was wow. amazed, so that was really good. So I was excited. But in the past, that used to, that would deter me. Like as soon as mm -hmm. I hit a plateau, I'd be like, oh, well, Oh, well. yeah, not working. Right. It's not working anymore. I guess I'm supposed to be this way forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I would stop. Yeah. And I'm like, nope, not anymore. I'm going. like, now I'm like, I have to keep going. I have, if I want to be here, I have to. Yeah. So I'm like, I have no choice. We mentioned the colors in your wardrobe, which I think could be indicative of your mental health through this oh, whole yes. journey. How would you say you're feeling today compared to a year ago? So much happier. Hmm. I was actually saying that my husband told me the other day I have more pep. Hmm. And oh, I did man. before, and I was like, yep, I actually wake up in the morning, and I'm happy to get up in the morning. I'm yeah. not laying in bed because I don't want to get out of bed, mm -hmm. which is huge. Because I would lay there some days like, nope, don't even want to get up. Mm. I'm like, yeah. I just want to stay here. Now I'm like, I want to do things. I look forward to getting up, and I look forward to walking mm -hmm. and, like, getting outside and doing things. So it's great. It's huge. You know, Al talked about this Start Today community so long ago, right? And it's been so rewarding to step back and watch all of you. seems like you guys have really bonded in cities all over the country. I've made a ton ton of friends in that mm. group. I've never met them, but we've become social media friends. Oh. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, even today, they were all messaging me like, good luck, oh. we're so happy for you, you inspire us. And I'm like, I feel like they're, I honestly, most of them feel like they're family to me mm -hmm. now. That's like amazing. we've gotten very close. So I'm like, hopefully one day I can meet them, but yeah. you know. <laughs> so maybe there's somebody sitting at home right now, Melissa, who, who's, you know, had that problem and trying to get up and get out and get, take those first steps. Mm -hmm. Cause you were there. Yes. What, what would you say to that person watching right now? Just get up and do it. I was walking mm -hmm. a half a mile for like two months, but you mm -hmm. know what? It was a half a mile more than what I was doing. Mm -hmm. That's all you can do. Do it. it doesn't matter. Any little bit of movement is important. So as long as you get up and move, yeah, it's better than nothing at all. And it's more than what you were doing the day before that and the day before that is mm -hmm. the way I looked at it. 
and eventually it's like you're going to get to whatever your goals are. It may take a while, but you'll get there. Yeah. How's it been for your family watching this for you? Good, very good. They're very mm -hmm. excited. Very, very excited. They're constantly telling me, like, you're a whole new person. We can't believe it. We're so happy for it's you. Incredible. Like, just the health changes alone have been huge. Because yeah. so. you can't be there for your family unless you're there for That's yourself. That's exactly right. what I told myself. I'm like, I have three kids. Like, if mm -hmm. I want to see them get married and maybe have kids one day, I'm like, I have to do something yeah, because it's not getting you, any better. You are such an inspiration. And thank so many you. people sitting at home now can look at you and it's like, okay, I can walk a half a mile today. Yes, yep. so yeah, that's you. all you need to do just yeah. to get started. And it's not even thank, that. Just yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Thank you so much thank for sharing you. your story. Just ahead, we are going to meet a dad of two to find out how an unexpected wake-up call changed his life. We'll be right back. We're back and continuing to highlight folks who have made incredible transformation. And this next guy is no exception. Back in 2021, Bayar Bayar Sekhan got an unexpected wake-up call when he received a life-threatening health diagnosis. As a dad of two young boys, Bayar decided to make a change. He started eating healthier and switched to a more active lifestyle. Since then, he has lost nearly half his body weight. Bayar visited our show last year to share his amazing transformation and how it actually inspired his kids. For most of my life, I've always been overweight. At my heaviest, I weighed 500 pounds. I often felt so tired that I would have to sit down to do the dishes or tell my kids that I was too exhausted to play with them. My wife would encourage me to start walking, but I lost interest in doing anything. In January 2021, I finally paid a visit to my doctor. I was diagnosed with a severe high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and type 2 diabetes. And then he told me I was only expected to live until my 40s. That was the moment I knew I had to make a change. So I switched up my diet, but my biggest challenge was that I was addicted to sugar. I usually consumed about 200 grams of sugar a day. Over time, I learned how to control my portions, which slowly killed my cravings. I started walking, running, swimming, and eventually started strength training. Last summer, I even completed my first triathlon. Today, I have lost nearly half of my body weight, shedding 230 pounds in two years, and I have never felt better. Wow. This is quite the transformation. So we want to pull out this picture here. This was by our two years ago. Okay. And he's with us here. Here is Bayar now. We're here. Oh my goodness. Hi. Wow. Hi, look at you. Hey, hey. How are you? Thank you for coming. Hey, hey. Congratulations. Hi. Hi. So you. nice to meet you nice and to welcome. have you. Here. Thank you for coming. Have a sit down. Thank you. Yes. So great. I mean, you look great. I know. How are you feeling? Do you feel as great as you look? I definitely do. I mean, the feeling of it's it's actually amazing. And then wow. I wanna share it. I yeah. love that. As you should, and you know, not just share it with your beautiful family, but to share it with everyone watching. So let's get into the nitty gritty here because you, you admitted in that spot that sugar was your weakness. You craved sugar, you couldn't give up sugar. So how were you able to curb that craving? Uh, I mean, it takes a time. It took me a definite a lot of days and years and months. I mean, months and years right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned how to temper it down because as a 
as a human being, you cannot just stop everything at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Because your, your brain is not actually meant to do that. Mm -hmm. So it takes time, but like I had to cut it little by little. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. Yeah. So you went to the doctor initially, I read, or one of the reasons was because you were really tired all of the time. Was the weight affecting your sleep? Yes. So um, as, as I, I mean, what I was experiencing was like, I, I had to actually take naps. Hmm. My, my naps was not even regular naps. So like I had to take two hours. You were like naps. sleeping. I was like sleeping for yeah. two hours in the afternoons every hmm. single day, even at jobs on my chairs. Hmm. Wow. And then it was crazy. Mm -hmm. you, and you were someone who never exercised before. And then all of a sudden you, do, you start with the strength training. And then I read that you actually competed in a triathlon. Amazing. And, and now is it true you're training for another one? Yes, yeah, so last year I did a nine mile, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. This year I'm doing it 32 miles. Wow. Yes. Challenging myself. Wow. 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 When is that? Are you ready for it? August 27th. It's coming up. It's coming up, mm -hmm. so I'm actually about to start my sessions soon. Wow. For wow. The training. Good for you. How old are your kids? I have a five and a nine year old. A five and a nine. So your kids old enough to understand what daddy has been through and his and oh, journey? Oh, they, they are so motivated by me that they are actually like doing something on their own right now, like mm. the push ups and stuff. Like oh. they see me doing it. Now they're mm. doing it on their own without even me telling them. You're that example for them. Yeah. Well, how would you say your mental health is tied into mm. your weight loss? Uh, it has definitely changed my life because when I was obese, I mean, I was morbidly obese. So when I was at this stage, I was lazy. I did not have motivation to do anything. Um, no short term, long term goals thinking about it. I just mm. learned to just live day to day. Mm. But now today I'm like more motivated to do things and inspire and especially my mental health has been to the point where like even like in this simple task like remembering things it changes mm -hmm. lives because really? mm. when you're obese your brain does not work the way it's supposed to mm -hmm. and you don't even remember things like for like your tasks mm -hmm. so even like simple like that wow i love it we talk a lot about health and wellness on this show and i think for all of us we all agree it's not about the number on the scale right, right? we know a lot of folks who you know our weight fluctuates or have you but what would you say is the takeaway for people watching at home it's more than just pounds isn't it it's more than just weight it is definitely more than just the weights like right now i'm going through a situation where i'm shrinking but the pounds are staying the same so mm. uh i have learned that people are getting dismotivated by the scale so mm. I would definitely tell people not to do that. Mm. Uh, I would like to motivate people just take the process, keep going, stay consistent with it, but definitely find your motivation. Mm -hmm. What motivates you? Uh, that's the key to yeah. it. Yeah. Well, well done, sir. I know. Yeah, well done. So proud. And I know your, your wife and kids are too. Yeah, yes. Right, thank you great. so much. That was good. A big thank you to our community members for sharing their stories with us. We hope this has inspired you to embrace your own health journey. And that wraps up this episode of Star Today. Don't forget, scan the QR code to sign up for our newsletter. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we will see you next time on Today All Day. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're going to learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges 
broke barriers in 1960. Or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists. And Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Ducky Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Ducky Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duck Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Ducky Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po' boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase, Jr. and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Ducky Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades, from red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Dookie. 
but the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. Exactly. It's we great to everything. Really good. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase oh, to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, 
Herbert Woods when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner, Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. It's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been so long. It's been mm. way too long. I missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's had. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. We uh -huh. add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, you yeah. See how gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep. They'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like, I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to. I'm gonna try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow, that looks perfect. Now this now is you're what, a thigh person. This is so I, I know what you're person. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, it's moist, crisp. Oh, your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and um, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ain't here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activists U.E.P. Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come to the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, babe. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting our pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course, grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. Say cheesecake. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Hi there, guys. Welcome to The Boost. On today's show, we'll meet the stars behind a few viral TikTok videos. But let's get things started. We're going to take a look at a special club that's all about food, friendship, and paying it forward. It's better to give than to receive. That's what my mother taught me. The feeling you get is indescribable. Richard Brooks loves to dine in surprise with a group of friends who call themselves the Thousand Dollar Breakfast Club. The goal of the club is to make a server very happy with at least a thousand dollar tip. Currently a lawyer, Richard knows the difference a big tip can make. When I was in college, I was a waiter. My biggest tip ever was $20, and I remember it. I remember the person giving it to me. I remember the feeling I got. I don't know why they gave it to me. Maybe they just thought that I was a hardworking kid going to college. He would continue sharing that feeling by giving service workers $100 here and there. But it was his brother who inspired Richard earlier this year to take it to the next level. My brother called me from California and said, hey Richard, guess what I just did, what? I just went to this breakfast where everybody gives a $100 bill and they give the waiter or waitress a $1,000 tip. So he knew I would do it and by that night I had gotten 10 friends together and we started the club. After their first surprise in March. Well, this tip is for you, $1,400. Wow. The friends met every couple of months at various restaurants around Massachusetts. My favorite one so far was the surfer who said, with a big smile on his face, my mother's been trying to buy a hearing aid for herself, so I'm going to go home today and buy her a hearing aid. And he did. The members of the club get as much from this as the restaurant workers do. It's nice to be able to do something like this and uh, just try and pay it forward. The way the world has been the last couple of years, the world needs more of this. So it's an honor to do this. My late son, Christopher, was in the business for many, many years, and I saw how hard he worked. So this breakfast club, it just warms my heart to see the reaction on the faces of those that are receiving this money. We really want this to spread and we want others around the country to understand that you don't have to be a celebrity or a millionaire to do something special to really make somebody's day. I'm a teacher, we just want people around the world to realize you can do this. Now that club is gaining attention and motivating others to do the same. 
we got the chance to join the thousand dollar breakfast club as they head to red's kitchen and tavern in peabody where mimi joyce has no idea what's in store for her hi everyone i'm mimi i'm gonna be your hi, server mimi. are you all set to order Enjoy a little more coffee after settling the bill oh, yeah. it's time for the big surprise the only reason we're here is for you oh. every single person in this room has given a hundred dollar tip so oh my goodness. We have a big tip for you. This Thank is the fun you, everybody. Part. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, one, two, Oh my gosh. 13, oh my God. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 1900. Thank you so much. Thank everybody. you so much. Thank you. We get wow. just as much pleasure as you do, believe it. It's so fun to I'm this. so happy right now. I feel like I just won a million bucks, really. Thank you oh, so a much. A single mom who's been working in restaurants for nearly 25 years. This experience, priceless. I plan to use this tip by paying off some bills and making sure my kids have everything that they ask for. And also to pay it forward by giving a nice tip to my servers. <laughs> My heart feels happy right now. I, I just feel like that was just so generous and I feel really overwhelmed with gratitude. Can I give you a hug? Oh, you can give me a hug, of course. Thank you so much. Enjoy it. Now let's turn to complete strangers coming together and having kind conversations all in the hopes of bridging a divide. Meet the founder of One Small Step. I am nervous, I am excited, I am coming into this with an open heart and an open mind. I am very excited to see how this turns out, what we have in common, and what differences we have and how that can still unite us. In Wichita, Kansas, strangers Lamisha Courtney and Brandy Hibbs are about to meet for the first time. This scheduled coming together of strangers is all part of the nonprofit One Small Step, which hosts and records 50 minute conversations between people with different political views. Prior to the conversation, Misha and Brandy were given each other's bios. I know she's a single mom, has three children. She is um, from a family of six, that she has children of her own, that her father was in the military. One Small Step founder Dave Isay is on a crusade to unify our country, one conversation at a time. You know, if we spent more time listening to each other and less time screaming at each other and hating each other, what a better and stronger country it would be. One Small Step uses contact theory psychology under the premise that it's hard to hate up close. Part of the secret sauce of One Small Step is that we don't talk about politics. This is just about two human beings looking each other in the eye and talking about what really matters to them. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> A facilitator handed them their first question. So Brandy, tell me about one or two people in your life who have had the biggest influence on you. A place they found common ground. I have to say my parents, hands down. They had me when they were super young. Um, and we're not prepared to be parents. I would say the exact same. Um, my parents were and still are some of the most important people to me. So when you were talking about your parents, like I was like, oh gosh, that's me too. They soon discovered differences on some hot button issues. I'm definitely more on the conservative side. I am very pro-life. My faith as being a Christian, definitely something that has molded me to who I am, but also shaped my beliefs. Certain segments of population say pro-life, but don't want to have gun laws in place that stop the lives of innocent children in schools being killed. Personally, you know, being an open carrier myself, um, I prefer that. I'd rather see it and know who's got it, but I still think there should be training that's involved um, in the handling of the weapons and the safety of the weapons and things like that. Misha shared her biggest war. fears as a mother. People talk about Black Lives Matter and, oh, we don't like them because they start. No, what we're trying to say is that we want our lives to matter just as much as anybody else's lives. I don't want to have to worry about my children walking the street in my neighborhood and never coming home. I worry when they go to the snow cone stand with their friends that don't look like them. And I just wish we lived in a world where I didn't have to worry about that. I wish I had the words to respond because honestly, um, and it's it's something that you know I've I've thought about, but I 
I don't understand it. If there's something I can do to increase my knowledge and learn more about your perspective, then I'm all for it. In the end, they found some common ground. Your desire to want to know more or saying, what can I do? That's the first step. Sure. Just, okay, being willing to, okay, I don't understand. How can I understand or what can I, who can I talk to? What can I learn? And so even a new friendship. <laughs> I've found a, a friend um, with Misha. Um, and, and I'd love to be able to keep in touch. So I didn't come looking for a friend, but I think I found one. Every interview ends the same way. It almost belies belief. You know, it decreases fear of the other and, and it allows us to see the human being and the American sitting across from us. Coming up, a remarkable woman fighting ALS with a lot of humor and heart right after this. on the boost with a story about a remarkable young woman who's finding light in the darkness. Diagnosed with ALS, she is determined to show the world what it's really like to live with an incurable disease. And she's doing it with heart, humor, and amazing grace. If you had to describe 34-year-old Brooke Eby's love language, it would probably be laughter. Brooke, you are the most cheerful person I can imagine who has such a serious diagnosis. What gives you that joie de vivre, this joy? <sighs> Levity is my superpower, and it's really how I'm bringing my story to the world. I'm trying to use humor and really let ALS be heard. At the young age of 29, Brooke began experiencing weakness in her legs. It took doctors three years to diagnose her with ALS, a rapidly progressing neurodegenerative disease. It's a devastating diagnosis, and there are no survivors. Thank you. Today we're seeing my neurologist. It's not really an appointment I think any ALS patient looks forward to, mostly because you're always getting worse. I am seeing that you're weaker in your right leg. Was there a moment when you finally got that diagnosis where you didn't have that mm -hmm. positive attitude? I mean, you'd be very human yeah. if your heart was broken. I remember crawling into bed with like a bag of M&Ms, party size, and just two to three months of blink from there. It was just survival. I heard there was a turnaround at a wedding yeah. when you were a bridesmaid. Yes, one of my best friends was getting married and I was in the wedding, which you can't hide when you're a bridesmaid. And a couple of my friends were like, why don't we just try to make it really fun? And a couple hours later, we had the bride limboing under my walker. I was giving people walker rides all over the dance floor. Brooke realized if she could get people smiling and laughing, maybe they would hear what she had to say, too. She soon started posting on social media about her ALS journey in her way. Today, we are driving to go borrow my first wheelchair. The pharmacist spent 10 minutes telling me how bad this tastes. I think. People are so scared to talk about a terminal diagnosis and death and what that looks like in a young person. But 
If you see yourself in me and you're able to laugh with me, then hopefully people are taking away more about ALS. Brooke's posts have since had millions of views. Her series on dating with ALS has been a fan favorite. You did one Instagram post about dating and telling your would-be suitors that you have a cane. Mm -hmm. What were your pickup lines? Dating me is like getting to cut the lines at Disney World. <laughs> She's a 10, but she needs a lot of pick-me-up. <laughs> I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to hold her upright. <laughs> Can you read some of the responses? Because there were some very good ones. I was impressed. Mm -hmm. OK, I see you, Abraham Limpin. <laughs> I feel like we're in the Bible, because you're Cain and I'm Abel. <laughs> That's a winner right there. That was a winner. <laughs> if only laughter really were the best medicine, because for ALS, there are very few options. You get diagnosed. They tell you two to five years. Here are three medications that might help you out for a couple of months. Mm -hmm and we'll just follow you from there. Which makes the sparkle in Brooke's eyes all the more astonishing. If people know anything about ALS, they think about that ALS ice bucket challenge a few years back. Everyone was doing it, mm -hmm. and people might think they must not need any money at all. Yeah. The ice bucket challenge was a really great step because it helped fund one medication. We still don't have a cure. So the disease, I would still say, is very underfunded. I know being introspective isn't your favorite thing, but something like this must teach you so much. So much. When you picture your future, you kind of picture like a runway. You can picture, you know, travel or career, or growing your family. When I got diagnosed, the future, that runway was just cut off. Like the future no longer exists for me. And that's a heavy thing, but not everything that's changed has been super sad and so I think I'm aware of more of the beauty and kindness in the world now than I was. A new sense. A sixth sense. A sixth sense. I'm the sixth sense. <laughs> <laughs> I see nice people. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed looking at my... And Brooke plans on using her voice even after this disease takes it from her. Yes. So what would you want to tell people? Well, you still can. There are two things that I would ask of people to do. ALS research needs money, so find the ALS organization that speaks to you and give, donate. And then two is follow my story. I think we associate ALS with characters who don't look like me. So I want people on this journey with me and know that we're gonna laugh along the way, but don't look away. This next man describes himself as a glass half full kind of guy, a mindset that's helped him overcome some enormous challenges and create a beautiful life. Take a look. Francesco Clark is living a life he could have never imagined. I'm lucky. Mm. I really just feel like I'm living a dream. I love that you just said, I'm lucky, and yet you've lived through some pretty hard things. I think life is best acknowledged through the perspective that you look, whatever lens you look through. Yeah. 21 years ago, when Francesco dove into a pool, his life changed forever. Talk to me a little bit about that day. I was 24 years old. I was working in fashion. I was working at Harper's Bazaar, just got promoted. And I felt like I was unstoppable. I dove in thinking it was a deep end. I was paralyzed in the blink of an eye. I became a shadow of myself for three years after I had to redefine my life in a wheelchair. And not being able to get up and get a glass of water at midnight when you're thirsty or or go out with your friends when you want to. I felt like an infant. I couldn't look in a mirror. I couldn't be in a room. Because what would you see when you looked in a mirror? All I would notice was a wheelchair, and I would burst into tears. I realized that a secondary effect of my injury was that my skin stopped sweating. So I developed rosacea, eczema, and a hypersensitivity to ingredients that every other skincare line uses that made my skin look older. So when I looked in the mirror, it wasn't me. 
and I felt betrayed by my reflection. Francesco's father was a medical doctor also trained in homeopathy and helped his son come up with a unique formula to help his skin. Clark's Botanicals never was a business plan. It was something that I started from a hospital bed to empower myself. It was a psychological and emotional recovery. So how did Clark's help heal you? It helped me connect. It helped me feel like a human being again. Friends and family started to notice the improvement in Francesco's skin and they wanted in. In 2008, Francesco's personal project bloomed into a business. And today he is CEO of an award-winning global brand. I can't help but think about how much hope and resilience there is in your story and probably what hard work it took to find that hope. You have to wake up every morning and work at it. Email Raymond. It doesn't just happen. I don't live in a dream that every day is a good day, but you deal with them and you work through them. Francesco's life has become even more full. He found love with partner Alberto Mahelcic Banzana and with the help of a surrogate, welcomed twins this past June. Now we have two giggly, chubby babies that really center me <laughs> and make me feel more determined and make me feel calm. Our little miracles. <laughs> Look at his smile. Francesco and his family have written their own script, and it's a beautiful one. Does this feel like when you have the, these babes in your arms that your family's complete? Yes. Yes. Yeah. This is our unit, and this is our purpose. My sense of self is no longer about me, and my existence now encompasses so much more. For me, my spinal cord injury was something that happened, but my life could have ended, mm -hmm. and I could have become a memory of somebody who could have been, instead of somebody who now is. Still ahead, the stay-at-home mom who's turned into a TikTok sensation. We will introduce you to her right after this. Today we're spotlighting a woman who found her true calling a little later in life when she decided to make a dramatic turn and try her hand at comedy. Here's her story. A few years ago, Zarna Gar got an unexpected gift. 
So how many messages in total came in? I think 140 something. Messages written by friends and family, compiled by her daughter, Zoya. These notes were the final push she needed to try professional comedy. I wept on how much time my daughter spent doing this when she should have been studying for the SATs. <laughs> Growing up in India, Zarna didn't even know what a comedian was. The youngest of four, she was just 14 when her mom passed away. It was a very sudden situation. And my dad, I think her death broke him in some way. So he just decided the next day, he's like, you need to get married. He had no school <laughs> hopes for you, no job no. hopes, just get married? No, and you know, he was not a bad guy. I, like, I didn't hold it against him then, nor do I now. But Zarna had other plans. She decided to move to America and become a lawyer. She got married, started a family, and became a full-time mom. Yeah, three kids, but I was dying inside, dying. I really wanted to get back to work. I couldn't figure out a way out. It was very complicated. Her way out was right in front of her. For years, she'd been entertaining family and friends. If you are good, you will get to see a delegate. Quietly perfecting her act. And my daughter is like, Mom, people like do this for a living. I'm like, no, they don't. What are you talking about? And then my kids ganged up on me. Her kids convinced her to start performing at open mics around New York City. I'm an immigrant, you guys. I came to America with $9 in my pocket. 10000 in the bank, but nine in the pocket. <laughs> Indian people only wrote the ultimate book on sex. To which she responded, we wrote Fifty Shades of Grey. During the pandemic, they also got her to post videos on social media, or more than 200 million have laughed right along with her. Okay, can we please focus? Focus is not a word. That's it is a word. It is plural of focus is foci. Now Hillary Clinton and Kevin Hart have cast Zarna on their shows. She's even got her own comedy special in the works. I think what I find so interesting about your story is how much of it was you taking the reins. Oh, but how else is it going to happen? All because she took comedy seriously. For today, Vanita Nair, NBC News, New York. Now to the story of a bond between a barber and one of his young clients. Let's see how these two ended up with a viral video that's now been viewed by millions of people. The slang term for a haircut is getting your ears lowered. You want to say hi to everybody? Hi. Hi. But this one will get your spirits raised. And go. That's seven-year-old Ellison Eubanks laughing in the barber chair, a sight his mom, Julie, never thought she'd see. You see, for Ellison, who has Down syndrome, haircuts were once on par with root canals. They were sensory overload. I felt like we would leave every appointment kind of, you know, traumatized, and he would have even more of a negative view of a haircut than he did before. Then they met Vernon Jackson. You did an awesome job, man. I'm so proud of you. Who just seem to have the right touch. It's something about Vernon's energy is really cool. Ellison just gravitated towards him right away. And he treated him like a human being, like any other client. A couple years ago, Vernon created the Gifted event. Using money donated by the community, he gives free haircuts to kids with special needs, to those who may otherwise feel marginalized. I'm sort of like, no, I see you and I'm going to address you as you may have seen. I'm here with you through the process. During his second haircut with Vernon in January, Ellison, who's known as a bit of a class clown, suddenly decided to play a game of stop and go, bringing sheer joy. Video of this moment has been watched on TikTok more than three million times. The people that are viewing the video are being healed from their perspective and their stigma and having a little more patience with the children. A valuable <laughs> lesson that, thanks to Vernon and Ellison, and is getting the green light. Did you say go? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's like their BFF now, you know? Like, he loves going there. He walks in and he gives him a hug and he knows to sit in the chair and he knows that it's a safe place. Hey, we finished. 
After the break, we got another uplifting story for you. You do not want to miss it. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Boost. We couldn't leave you without one more feel-good story. Check it out. It was guaranteed to be a memorable moment, so a man was proposing to his longtime girlfriend on the beach. The young uh, couple's daughter was there to be part of the occasion, but things don't always go as, as planned. So the man first asked the daughter, is it okay if I ask mommy a question? No. She said no. And then moments <laughs> later, mommy put the girl down. After she took a few steps, guess what? She spotted the camera. So she did what any toddler would oh, do, go right up to it. Oh, wait. This, of course, while the whole proposal is happening. <laughs> Romantic proposal on in the background. Um, yeah. <laughs> she said yes. Um, <laughs> oh, that's that's framed there. perfectly. That's great. It's actually oh, perfect. By the way, they're in hysterics. I love it. Uh, anyway, there you go. Great. Isn't that a good one? That's that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us here on The Boost, and we hope you are feeling the power of positivity after today's show, and we'll see you back here tomorrow on Today All Day. Hello, and welcome to Inside the Game. This is where we take you behind the scenes of the NFL. I'm Craig Melvin. As you know, the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles are going to be facing off in Super Bowl 57 this Sunday. Before the big day, let's take an inside look at how NFL teams prepare for games. So, first up, the Miami Dolphins made some explosive plays this season. NBC's Jacob Sobroff gets the secret behind one of pro football's fastest teams. Take a look. The Miami Dolphins say their not-so-secret weapon is their speed. Here's Mostert with running room to the 10, the 5, touchdown! The speed for you, one of the top metrics for you as an NFL speed. player. Speed is definitely a top metric for me. Raheem Mostert and his teammates Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell are three of the fastest players in the NFL regularly hitting 21, 22, even 23 miles per hour on the gridiron. That's how fast I drive when my children are in my car. <laughs> That's how fast you run. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. Uh, you're able to track the miles per hour I mean, and see how fast you're going. The Dolphins head strength and conditioning coach Dave Poloka says those incredible speeds are just one of the many data points gathered by small radio frequency ID chips affixed to players' jerseys and pads. This is the tag. That's what it looks like. This is it. And you can feel how light that is. That's crazy. Here's a quarter. Here's the tag. Almost exactly the same size. On game days, all 32 teams in the NFL are tracked by sensors embedded in pads, pylons, even the ball. But only about a third of the teams use the technology during practice, including the Dolphins. Why are the Dolphins all in on this technology? It just makes sense. It's a no-brainer. You know, when it comes to being able to see what they're doing out in the field, how they're responding to the stresses of practice, and and then how we can tweak things to make sure that they're performing on an optimal level. 
Miami's coaches and an analytics team monitor about 108,000 data points in real time. Where guys are at compared to their averages during practice, speeds that's being hit, distance that's being covered. It's like putting a, a tracker on your car and knowing how many miles you covered in a day. Coach Poloka says the information's just one part of the equation. The information is not anything secretive, really. It's, it's really how you execute it, and it's really how you are able to communicate with players and, and to get them to buy in and understand the why behind what you're trying to get them to do. You can have all the information in the world. If you can't communicate it effectively to these guys, and if they don't trust you, it's, it's going to be useless. And while speed's an important factor, Oloka says it's not everything. We're looking at a ton of other metrics to be able to say, you know, okay, this guy is, is doing a little too much, maybe we should pull back, or, or he's not doing enough. Might the guys ever push themselves too hard because they have access to all this data? Sure. Yeah, and we want that. We want to be the ones to have to pull them back. But we also have to be smart. And so for a guy like Raheem, if he's doing too much, we might want to pull back a little bit because we still got a few more days and, you know, we want to get him to Sunday. For Mostert, he says the data fuels some healthy competition and prevents him from getting injured. I think a lot of people would feel nervous if, if there was a chip tracking their every movement and their speed. You like it. Oh, yeah, I love it. I go up to the guys that are running a laptop and ask them, hey, you know what I get? And they'll be like, yeah, you, you got 18. So um, that's when I try to you know, ramp up you know, in practice. You want to get as much as you possibly can, but still preserving your body uh, leading up into the game. And then when the game comes, that's when you have to let it fly. Man, talk about speed, right? Now, ever wonder what it takes to feed an entire NFL team? Well, NBC's Harry Smith takes us inside the game and kitchen to find out how the New York Giants fuel dozens of players and staff before a big game. New York Giants football practice is all about finding the advantage, the split second, the right move, the repetition that can make the difference between success and failure. Everything matters in pro football, including what you eat. My rookie year, I remember going out to practice, and I had to ask some older guys, hey, what are you eating before practice? Because I don't feel the best right now. Like, I feel slow, I don't have much energy. Julian Love is a team captain and leads the Giants in tackles. Flips it to Tunyon, and Tunyon yanked down by Julian Love. So then that's when they put me on game two, what a true pro is supposed to eat. The Giants Kitchen opens at 5 a.m. every day. It's like the diner of your dreams, except that most everything they prepare has real nutritional value. Very rarely is nutrition going to be the number one reason why you win, but it can become the reason why you lose. Steve Smith is the Giants Director of Sports and Performance Nutrition. Does every player have his own food game plan? That's the ideal goal. But the good part is that the best friend that I could possibly ever have is our kitchen staff because they're basically creating the physical representation of what I'm recommending. Men who have played in the NFL describe the physical toll of a typical game as akin to being in a car wreck, maybe more than one. Giants offensive lineman Nick Gates knows all about it. He showed us scars of what many believed would have been a career-ending injury. It was a Thursday night game, uh, September 16th, and uh, about 11 or 12 plays in, somebody fell on me and uh, snapped my leg in half, broke my tibia and fibula. After the injury, Gates lost 30 to 40 pounds. He needed a lot of calories to get him back to his ideal weight of 312. Eating the right things and eating healthy and not just junk food and, and crappy food to you know put the weight back on. I need good weight, not bad weight. The head coach in the kitchen is Angelo Bassalone, the Giants' executive chef. He leads a squad of nine. Talk about a cool job. They're long days, but, you know, they're, they're fun days. We, we go through a lot of food. A lot of food is a bit of an understatement. 200 pounds of fish, 300 pounds of meat, and 500 pounds of chicken a week. And you're not Chick-fil-A. We're not Chick-fil-A. Is there a meal that you've made that you think makes the difference between winning and losing? As long as they're, they come in here and they're eating and they're happy, that's, that's the most important thing. I was once paid a compliment by one of the players that we made oxtails the one day and he ate them and he's like, 
this reminds me of my grandmother's. So if you can make that connection, something from home, then I, I won. Chef should have been flagged, though, for allowing your reporter into the game. What are we making today? So today, what we do on travel days often is something quick that they can grab. So we're going to do a bowl. Uh, we're doing a chimichurri shrimp bowl. Beautiful. No, no, it's not beautiful. <laughs> it's, it's a freaking mess. Awesome. Thank you. Absolutely awesome. Take a look at that, will you? So you want to grow up to be an NFL player for the fine dining. <laughs> By the way, 312 pound Nick Gates' cheat meal. It's not burgers, not pizza. It's tons of sushi. That's right, sushi. Coming up, Chanel Jones, front row seat to how the NFL Films Group covers the league. Plus, Chanel also spent some time catching up with the Eagles' legendary radio team. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Inside the Game. If you've ever been to an NFL game, you'll see these guys on the sidelines. A, a small army capturing every detail in real time. My fellow third hour co-host and diehard Eagles fan, by the way, Chanel Jones, she got to see firsthand how the NFL films crew covers the entire league. They bring you an up close and personal look at America's biggest sport. NFL Films has been on the sidelines for the biggest games for more than 60 years. We have a lot of cameras that are shooting art at the game, trying to, trying to just show you different perspectives of football. And I think that is our main goal, is to give you a different look. As a fan up in the stands, you're watching these guys like, what are they saying? Like, what are they saying on the bench? I just want to sack the quarterback, dude. So just hearing all the different things that guys are talking about on the field and the motivations and everything is what's cool for me. Not as easy as it looks. <laughs> NFL Films has as many as five different crews at a game to capture all those insider sights and sounds. Quarterback's just really good. We followed cinematographer DJ and audio technician Sean. The crew assigned to sprinting around looking for inside the game sound. In the tunnels, pregame huddles, behind the benches, covering about six miles of ground, all while carrying around 25 pounds of equipment. It's not just sitting around in one position filming your camera. You're going from here to there to there to there. I mean, it's just, it's a rush. Sean, Sean, Sean. I mean, I am sore after a game. Really? Every game I'm sore. I need, I need time to recover. I do. We know the players are sore, but I don't think people realize the folks who are documenting what the players are doing, they fly back sore too. <laughs> we <Yep>. do. <laughs> We do. We don't get the treatment that they have, but we are sore, just <laughs> like those them. trainers. While their colleagues specialize in things like close-ups of game action, DJ and Sean are looking for the hidden details broadcast will miss. I, I got the play, and then um, it was worth just hanging on that corner for that reaction from number 11. Like conversations among players. Got to make a play on the football, man. That's how we're going to win the game. 
reactions to key plays, and coaching strategy. And let's say something big happens, whether it's an interception or a touchdown. What's the game plan? Are you trying to get the player, the coach, the teammates? I mean, what? All of the above. Yeah, exactly. All of the above. You've got to make a decision, and you got to go with it. Runners start sending all that footage back to colleagues even before kickoff and after every quarter. Then on Monday mornings, producers here at NFL Films headquarters in New Jersey take the handoff, special rolling through all the footage to find the best moments and sound bites. Why it's so important is if we miss something, it's lost forever. So when your star quarterback says a lot more plays to make, that is a good bite. We're telling the story of a game instead of just telling you what happened in the game. We're turning the football players into characters that you care about. And when you see a slow motion shot of somebody's face, you know, in anguish, all of a sudden you, you care about them in a way that you never would have seen if you would have just watched that from the top end. There's 22 guys on the field at once, and there's a lot of guys on a bench talking. So you just hope to get the right things. Now, how about another exclusive look? Chanel also caught up with the Eagles' legendary radio team, led by Merrill Reese, the longest-serving current play-by-play -play announcer in the NFL. It's one of the most important parts of a football game. We're not talking about the players or the coaches. The kick is... Go! We're talking about the commentators that amplify every jaw-dropping catch, heartbreaking moment, and historic touchdown. He's going to run. He's in! Touchdown! And one of the best-known commentating duos in the NFL is here in Philadelphia. Merrill Reese and Mike Quick lead the Eagles radio team. You are the longest-serving current play-by-play -play caller in the league. Tell me, what keeps you doing this year after year? I love it. I love it. There's nothing in the world I would rather do than be out here broadcasting NFL football and especially the Eagles. Broadcasting with Merrill for 25 years now, Mike was a five-time Pro Bowler with the Eagles. Mike, how natural was it for you to go from playing football to being in the announcer's booth? I know the game, so that helped a whole lot, but it wasn't a natural thing. I think that one of the toughest things for me was, and still is, is to criticize players. Mm -hmm. And I have to try and do it gingerly because I know what they go through. Merrill and Mike are so beloved in Philly, there's even a beer named after them. And everyone does a Merrill Reese impression, sometimes better than the man himself. They had on the radio show, they had this segment where people were calling in to imitate Merrill Reese, to try and do the best Merrill Reese. And actually, he called in. I, I called and, in. And he didn't win. <laughs> No way. I finished third. <laughs> I, I said I was Joe from Havertown. But impressions are one thing. Actually putting in the work is another. I think they just think, oh, you guys could do this with your eyes closed. <laughs> well, it, it's a little bit different. I mean, there are hours and hours and hours of preparation. It's so chaotic in the booth, but we have to make sure that it's seamless. It comes out like two guys just sitting talking football. He stepped up his head and falls forward, he fumbled and he fumbles the football, and the Eagles have it! For some, Merrill's description of the game is more than just a broadcaster's flourish. It's how they visualize football altogether. I received a, a, a very, very nice award from the Association of the Blind. I've had people say, you taught me football. Wow. Because I've never, I was born without sight. And when I hear that, it almost makes me want to oh. cry, and it means yeah. so much. After hearing all about the broadcast, I had to get a tour of the booth where it all happens. That's beautiful. Yeah. So what's the first thing you do when you come in? I look down on the field and I go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, 45, midfield, 45, 40, 35, 30, 25, 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown. Just to loosen up my lips. <laughs> While in the booth, I got to meet Bill Werndell, Merrill's spotter, who makes sure he doesn't miss a thing happening down on the field. These pins represent who's in the game. If a play develops, say, a Hargrave forces a fumble on Aaron Jones, I'll go, this guy forced the fumble, 
this guy recovers the fumble, you cannot become a fan. You have to concentrate every down. Is that the key? Absolutely. And during the games, Philadelphia sports legend Howard Eskin adds in commentary from the sidelines. I'm their eyes on the field. Sometimes I can hear the coach talk to the officials. And the officials are getting reamed out sometimes. And I'm trying to find out what the problem is that the coach thinks that they screwed up. Before wrapping up my visit with the Eagles radio team, I did have one request for Merrill. So, you know, it's everybody's dream to hear you say their name because you've got the voice. Okay. I'll never play football. But this might be the closest I'll How ever do you want me to say it? I had an idea. The crowd is on sleep. <laughs> now coming out of the tunnel. The MVP from Wichita, Kansas, and Northwestern University, Janelle Jones. Thank you. Coming up, a closer look at how the NFL and the emergency response teams try to keep players safe on the field. Then a little bit later, Sam Brock visits the famous pirate ship in the Buccaneers end zone. Stay with us. Welcome back. NBC's Jacob Sobroff takes us inside the game with some of the NFL's most important staffers, the doctors who ensure that players like DeMar Hamlin get the care they need. Take a look. NFL fans across the country were witness to the life-saving actions of the league's first responders earlier this month in Cincinnati. The ambulance is out there on the field and they are intensely working on DeMar Hamlin. When DeMar Hamlin collapsed after a routine play and suffered cardiac arrest. It was immediate recognition that this was a serious issue, not just your average player down. Immediate CPR and as soon as possible defibrillation. And, and that's what saved his life. Mahomes steps up, throws to the back, touchdown! Before this weekend's playoff game in Kansas City, I spoke with the league's top doctors who craft that emergency action plan, or EAP. They credit the local paramedics on call during each NFL game. There are people that do this every day, and, and that's one of the beautiful things about it. So it may happen at the stadium, but for these guys, it's, it's on the streets. Uh, for these guys, it's in the emergency department, and so that's why they're so well trained to do that. But we Dr. Jim Ellis is the league's director of emergency preparedness. Part of that response is having first-class equipment stationed just yards from the playing field. This sounds like not only what you find in an ambulance, but what you would find in an emergency room. Yeah, yep. that's, that's the goal. Dr. Alan Sills is the chief medical officer of the NFL. He walked me through the communication that propels responders into action. And then they're also usually going to give a visual signal. Each stadium has a visual signal that's sort of an all call. And that means we need everybody. We want all the medical staff. We want the emergency response people. We want the emergency equipment to be brought out. That's the 911 on the field for the NFL. That's right. 
if you need ALS response to do a driving signal, uh, that usually gets us out. We saw that for ourselves during the 60-minute meeting, where the various medical professionals assemble an hour before kickoff to go over the game plan for any on-field emergency or serious injury. Have a great, safe game. And while this team is prepared for the worst, they're more frequently tasked with attending to injuries like ligament tears and concussions. And to help with that diagnosis, there are replay monitors along the sidelines to review any potential alarming play or reaction. So these are video feeds from all the different cameras. All of those different camera feeds are being sent to our spotter's booth upstairs. And so this is an ongoing conversation between the medical professionals on the field and then the spotters up there. Up there is the concussion spotter booth, where certified physical trainers with binoculars in hand watch every play. We push this button. We just say stop the game, stop the game, stop the game. Dozens of field cameras provide in-depth perspective to help with injury diagnosis. So this doesn't stay up for the course of the game? No. You put it up when you need to use it? That's correct. Any times, sign of head uh, trauma, the player is escorted into this pop-up tent for immediate evaluation. This becomes a medical exam space. When we come inside the tent, now we can really concentrate, focus, communicate with each other, um, and have a private moment to do a medical exam. Jeff Miller is a longtime top lieutenant of NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. He's testified to Congress about the link between concussions and CTE. Miller oversees the league's health policies and rule changes to address safety concerns. Even updating policy midseason after head injuries to Dolphins QB Tuo Tungavailoa. If we're smart, we listen to experts and say, what could we do better? As science evolves, as understanding of health evolves, we have to take action to make sure that we're doing the best thing we can by the players. Balancing the recreation of a sport with the reality of its often punishing nature. I think health and safety hasn't become just a little buzzword. I think it's become a way that the league has tried to attack what happens in this game. This is not a game that you're going to see everyone walk off the field healthy. It's physical, there's contact. So how do you best prepare and mitigate to make it as safe as possible? That was great. All those people, all those staff keeping players safe. Uh, Jacob, thank you so much for that. Just ahead, Sam Brock visiting that very famous pirate ship in the Buccaneers end zone. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Inside the Game. Raymond James Stadium is where the Tampa Bay Buccaneers play. And iconic is really the only way to describe that massive pirate ship that sits in one of the end zones. Our correspondent Sam Brock got the chance to take a tour of the ship and to meet the man at the helm, Captain Cleve Johnson, who really has the job of a lifetime. If you've ever been to a Buccaneers home game, it's a spectacle you can't miss. A hundred foot long concrete vessel with mass nearly 80 feet high. A time honored treasure that won't ever sail. Landlocked at the end zone of Raymond James Stadium. When you were conceiving the franchise, where did the ship factor into all of that? That ship is Tampa. And with our pirate background and the Gasparilla heritage, and our fans love it. And when the flags rise and the sails get set and the cannons fire, it brings about a unity across the community in the stadium and outside the stadium. 
The captain at the helm, Cleve Johnson. Captain Cleve, as he's known, has manned the ship for every Bucks game for the last 25 years. He's never once missed a game. When you consider just like how cool it is to do this job. Oh, without a doubt. You can believe how many times a game somebody asks me, how do I get your job? Captain Cleve's favorite part of the job? Firing the cannons, naturally. For the Bucks team introductions, the shot across the bat, a warning shot when the Bucks get into the red zone. And the big celebration, one shot for every point scored. For the 99.9% .9 of fans that will never be inside of that ship, can you just describe the enormity of it? What does it feel like to stand in there and fire cannons? Well, it's a lot of responsibility. We can't fire the cannons unless we actually score. We're looking downfield to make sure that there's not a flag on the field or that he actually scored, you know, because if you look down at the other end zone, it could look like he got, you know, crossed the goal line, but it could be close. So we're, we're always waiting, and that's the pressure. Once a cannon shot goes off, it goes off. This is a precision profession. Yes. Four different cannons shoot smoke that comes from liquid CO2 being shot out. Two concussion cannons, the ones that make a boom, run on propane and oxygen, ignited by a spark plug. Usually, the materials last half a season. When the Bucks do score, the cannon fire echoes throughout the stadium. And if they're not ready for it, that thunderous boom can cause fans to jump. Also, quarterbacks like Cam Newton. During his first visit to Raymond James Stadium in 2013. What is the reaction of the crowd when those cannons explode? Well, if it's their first game, they jump. <laughs> but the most part, they're, they're begging for it. If they see a touchdown, fire the cannons, fire the cannons. They want us to fire the cannons. Captain Cleave showed me around the ship. A dangerous call, maybe. He even let me right. set off the cannons. Part one, huh? they just scored a touchdown. After 20 plus years of firing those cannons, how's your hearing doing? What? Oh, sorry. <laughs> exactly. Just, just kidding. Well, I know it's coming. So the ear that I have towards the cannon, I usually hold my ear. But yeah, it, if you're up there, it will rock your world if you're not ready for it. Thank you, Sam. That's it for us. Make sure to watch Super Bowl 57 this Sunday at 6.30. Whether you're rooting for the Eagles, whether you're rooting for the Chiefs, I hope you have a fantastic Super Bowl Sunday with friends and family. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Craig Melvin. We'll see you next time on Today All Day. Today all day, looking for a hot, delicious date? <laughs> Who is it? Up next on Hashtag Cooking, Sama Dada <laughs> is taking you on a date with dates. And it'll be hard not to fall in love. First up, she's making the perfect sweet and salty snack, miso almond date bites. Then she's going to whip up a creamy date shake. And then to top it off, a French toast smothered in a gooey date. Catamel. I do get hangry sometimes, <laughs> shockingly. You would think, because I'm always cooking, I never get hangry, but you know what? It just happens to the best of us. I have been dating for a long time, and no, it's not what you're thinking. I have been eating dates, dates, for a long time. I grew up around them, especially during Ramadan, when we would eat them to break our fast. And since then, I've been absolutely hooked and I hashtag cannot stop dating. I want you to be just as obsessed with dating as I am, so I'm gonna show you three of my favorite recipes. First up, we've got my miso almond date bites, which are salty and sweet. Then I'm gonna show you how to make my super simple vegan date shake. And finally, we're gonna make my favorite French toast with an almond butter date caramel. When you're shopping for dates, let me tell you something important. Make sure you're looking for the medjool variety. These are a lot sweeter and chewier than their other counterparts, which tend to be a bit drier and not as great to bake with, or cook with, or eat as a snack. I like to eat these plain as well, which is why I look for a nice, delicious, chewy, sweet medjool date, because you want something that's a nice, sweet snack, but you don't want anything that's dry. These miso almond crunch bites have everything going for them. They've got some umami from the miso, some crunch from the almonds. They're the perfect snack to keep in the fridge for when you want something a little sweet, but you still want to eat something wholesome. 
I'm putting in a solid amount because I love a date. These are gonna act as a really nice base, a really sweet and chewy base. It's gonna allow these bites to stick together and we're not gonna add any other sugar. I think that's way too many, but I don't care. So I got my dates in my blender and now I'm gonna add my almonds. I'm using just raw almonds here. These are gonna add the nice crunch to these bites. We love a lot of texture here. Now, to seal the deal, to seal those almonds in, I'm gonna add a little bit of almond butter. You can feel free to use the peanut butter or cashew butter. If you have any other butter in your pantry, feel free to use it. The almonds and the almond butter make this snack super wholesome and delicious. Now, we're gonna add some shredded coconut. Make sure you use the unsweetened variety here because the dates are already gonna add a lot of sweetness to the snack. So pretty. We're gonna add a little vanilla extract, just for a little vanilla. And finally, I'm gonna add some white miso paste. This is made from fermented soybeans, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking about miso soup. Stop that train of thought, halt it right there. This is just gonna add some nice umami flavor and balance out that really nice sweet date and almond combination. I'm gonna finish this off with a little pinch of salt just to bring everything together. Pull out that sweetness. Little pinch, not too much. And then we're ready to blend. Are you ready? I'm ready. Feel free to scrape down the sides if you need to. I need to. Just to get everything nicely incorporated. What you're looking for with this dough is to have some nice texture. So we don't need everything to be completely pulverized. Totally fine if we have some little bigger or smaller pieces of almonds. That's just gonna really contribute to the crunch. This is what we're looking for. As you can see, it's a bit thick, it's a bit sticky. This is gonna be great because it's gonna help us form it into our little bites. I wish you could smell this. It's like warm and salty and sweet, and I haven't even tasted it yet. Hmm, okay. I'm using a really cute cookie scoop here. We want it to be just shy of about a size of a golf ball, but you can make them bigger or smaller if you'd like. I like a little bite-sized bite I can just grab from the fridge when I want something a little sweet and salty. As you can see, this is what we're looking for. You can see a little piece of date here. You've got some different sizes of almond pieces. This is good. We like this. We like texture. It's a work of art. We love this bite. Look at how cute. First one done. My biggest struggle with no-bake recipes like this one is that it really is a challenge <laughs> to get everything to the parchment paper uh, before I eat it all. But I'm doing okay so far. I did sneak a little bite though, don't tell anyone. The dates make it really nice and sticky to form into a little ball as well, which is really great. They add a little sweetness, they allow it to adhere together. See, this is why I love dating. Look at that, super cute. I always have this in my fridge or freezer because I'm always a little hungry. <laughs> I always like to snack, so this is really nice to know. I feel secure when I have this in my freezer or fridge. We're almost at the end. There is a light at the end of this blender tunnel. Pretty good. Rolled out all of my dough into these cute little bites. And now I'm just gonna let them nap in the fridge for a little bit just to firm up while I melt my chocolate. Look at that. My little date bites have woken up from their nap in the fridge, and I think it's time to add some chocolate. I've melted my chocolate already, as you know. And now I'm just gonna do a really nice, cute drizzle. If you want a little more chocolate, if you want a little desserty vibe, feel free to completely submerge them. I'm just gonna do a nice little drizzle here. Look how smooth and melty that chocolate is. Look at that. All right, we're gonna start drizzling. You don't need too much on your spoon. Go a little light-handed so you can get a nice, cute, delicate drizzle. Or you can go full force, do a really heavy drizzle. Whatever is up to you. The reason I like melting chocolate with coconut oil is that it makes the chocolate really smooth and nice, really drizzleable. Drizzleable. 
I just make up words, honestly, at this point. Got my own dictionary, drizzleable. Makes it easier to drizzle. Feeling like you want more of a chocolate moment, feel free to completely submerge. Take them for a swim. I will not judge you. In fact, I'll support you all the way. If you're getting fancy, you can even do a little crisscross action like this. I mean, come on. Picasso calls. He wants his date balls back. All right, last one. They look so cute. And now I have one final little step. Just gonna add a little flaky sea salt on top. It's gonna bring out that chocolate. It's gonna balance out the sweetness. I love using flaky sea salt over my entire life. You ready? It's a little. It also looks really pretty too. Those big chunks of flaky salt. So pretty, it's so fancy. These bites are gonna take another little nap in the fridge for about 30 minutes. I want this chocolate to firm up and then they'll be ready to eat. What a successful nap. I mean, look at this. So pretty, you've got that nice chocolate drizzle, a little salty contrast. You know what? I should probably take a picture of them before I dig in, so I'm gonna do that. They look too cute not to. Just straight on the tray. Real life action, you know? I've gotta commend my own drizzling skills. I, I just have to have a moment for myself. Okay. I think I'm ready to taste. You know, I thought I was gonna plate them. I had this already, but I'm just gonna eat them straight from the tray because I can't wait. I just can't wait. Okay, here I go. Mmm. <laughs> what was that little almond piece in there? So sweet. The dates. <laughs> Simply in my teeth. The dates are so nicely sweet. The almonds add substance, a little crunch. That chocolate on top just seals everything together. And the salt brings all of the flavors out. And that miso, it gives this sort of savory undertone. There's a little salt, just trying to pick up the salt. No salt left behind, you know what I'm saying? Mm. These are so good. You guys have to try these. You guys have to try these. <laughs> <laughs> Little crunch. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, have I convinced you to eat more dates yet? No? Okay, that's kind of crazy. Well, challenge accepted. I'm gonna go grab the ingredients for my irresistible date shake and show you how it's done.
Not to brag or anything, but there are a lot of date farms in my home of Southern California. And with the date farms comes date shakes. I wanted to make a super creamy and delicious date shake, but without any of the dairy. But shh, I'm telling you, they'll never know. Okay, I've got to preface this recipe by telling you something. It is so easy to make, you'll never believe it. I'm just gonna add all of my ingredients into my blender and it does all the work for me. I've got my dates here, they're pitted. Don't leave any pits in there. That may not end well for you. Adding them straight into my blender. To make that super creamy milkshake vibe, I am using frozen bananas. This is a great way to rescue any of your ripe or nearly perished bananas that have just kind of been sitting on your counter for a while. Freeze them, make banana bread with them, make this date shake, super versatile. Also, when you're freezing your bananas, make sure to just cut them up into cute little slices like this. It'll make it a lot easier to blend. I like the nice little ice cream vibe that these bananas will give the date shake. Super good and flavorful. And the bananas add even more natural sweetness. In we go. A couple more things I'm adding. Some vanilla extract. And because I really want to feel hugged by this date shake, I'm going to add cinnamon because we all know cinnamon is like a hug in spice form. You know? Do you agree with me? I agree with me. Adding my cinnamon. Perfect. Now to blend everything together, I'm going to use some unsweetened almond milk. You can totally use another non-dairy milk option. An oat milk or a coconut would be really nice here as well. Adding my almond milk into my blender. Beautiful. Now all we do is blend. Wasn't that so easy? It's kind of crazy. I shouldn't have, but I did. Here we go. Prepare yourselves. I'm really excited. I think we're done. Now all I'm gonna do, pour it into my glass and enjoy. Hmm, okay. I mean, look how creamy that is. <gasps> that was it. That was our recipe. I need to send a picture to my parents. They're still in Southern California. Don't be really jealous. Okay. Okay, perfect. Now I get to drink it. So thick. It's too good. It's crazy that this is a plant-based milkshake. It's so creamy. It's so velvety, but there's no milk in it. We love a vegan date shake vibe. So good. Mm. So cute. So good. I could eat this forever. Eat it, drink it. I could drink it forever. My final recipe that really celebrates the magic of dates is an almond butter date caramel that you will want to put over your entire life, but we're just gonna put it on some French toast. I'm gonna go clean my blender and get the ingredients.
In college at Berkeley, whenever I went to breakfast with my friends, they would always go for the eggs benedict, the veggie omelets, but for me, I only had eyes for the French toast. There was a restaurant pretty close to campus called La Note that had one of the best French toasts I've ever had. It had a really nice and sweet, crisp exterior, and I knew I wanted to replicate something just like that in my own kitchen, but with a twist. So, inspired by the French toast of my dreams, we are gonna be making a French toast with an almond butter date caramel. We're gonna start by making an almond butter date caramel that is so luscious you will wanna drown your entire life in it. But today we're just gonna put it on some French toast. Let's start. Added some dates in my blender. We're gonna add a little bit of almond butter. The almond butter is gonna balance out the sweetness of the dates really nicely. To sweeten this up a little further and to add a little bit more of that caramel undertone, we're gonna add some coconut sugar. To make a super luscious and velvety caramel, we're gonna add some vanilla almond milk. I'm using vanilla here, but if you don't have a vanilla, if you just have an unsweetened, you can add a little touch of vanilla extract. My blender is truly my kitchen BFF, so now all we're gonna do is blend it right up. And caramel will await us on the other end of this. I think we're looking good. Look at how luscious that is. And of course, a traditional caramel is made by heating sugar up on a stove, but this is my version of a caramel that uses dates. Now you can see why I wanna put this over my entire life. Our almond butter date caramel is ready. All it needs now is some French toast, so I'm gonna go grab the ingredients to make it. Time to make our French toast. I've got all of the usual suspects here. My eggs, my cinnamon, my vanilla extract, and I also have some milk. I'm using almond milk here, but you can use your favorite. I'm gonna crack two of my eggs into my beautiful little pie dish here. Cute. Perfect. I'm gonna whisk my eggs together until you don't see any separation between the yolks and the white. I'm really putting my entire body into this. <laughs> Whisking eggs, morning workout, perfect. French toast, workout of your day, okay. I'm on board. Okay. 
This looks nice and smooth. Now I'm going to add some of my almond milk. Vanilla extract. Vanilla extract for me is a must when I'm making French toast. I just love that little extra sweetness, that little essence, really brings it to life. Little pinch of cinnamon now. We want this to be super smooth, super uniform. It's gonna be a nice little bath for our slices of bread. I'm gonna add a little coconut oil to my pan, let it melt, and then that's gonna be perfect for me to fry the bread in. Time to dredge our slices of bread in my little mixture here. I'm using sourdough bread here because I love that tangy taste. It's my favorite kind of bread. We're gonna let the bread really soak up that egg mixture. And by the way, French toast is a great use for your stale bread. So if you got any stale bread in your pantry, it's time to make some French toast. Gonna flip this over. Make sure it really soaks up all of that goodness. It smells really good already. Which I know is crazy because we haven't even cooked it. One last step before I cook my French toast. I'm gonna add a little sprinkle of coconut sugar on both sides because I want that really sweet crispness on the exterior. Look at that. It's gonna get some nice color as well. Now we're going straight to my pan. Hmm. You know what? No more. I'm adding a little extra sugar on top. So we want to cook these until they're nice and cooked through, golden brown on both sides, about three to five minutes per side. This is a great brunch recipe, a great breakfast recipe, and honestly a great dinner recipe too. Like who are we kidding? We can have French toast for dinner. There are no rules. I like pan frying these in coconut oil as well because I think it plays really nicely with that coconut sugar. All right, we are going to flip. You know, I consider myself a patient person, but then when I'm cooking French toast, I'm like, hurry up. Can't wait all day. It's not even that long. I don't know why I'm being so dramatic. Just gonna flip my second piece. Look at that color, looking so golden. Ready for a photo, ready for some caramel, some date caramel. All right, these are looking beautiful. I'm gonna transfer them to my plate. So I'm hungry. Do we think they're ready for their caramel? I think they're ready. All right. It's thick, it's luscious. I'm gonna be generous here. Nothing wrong with a little thick drizzle. Gotta dip in for some more. I really just went for it. <laughs> I was trying to be delicate before and now I'm just straight up going for it. I like having a little pool of caramel on the side. It looks really delicious. I'm gonna add some berries just to sidle up next to that date caramel, sit on top of it. They kind of stick nicely onto that caramel too. <laughs> a little powdered sugar. You can't tell me you don't want this. You just can't tell me you don't want it. It looks so pretty. I think my note would be proud. I should probably send them a picture. Maybe I'll slide into their DMs. <laughs> oh, it looks so pretty. The almond butter caramel, while delicious, it is a brown color and so is bread. So by adding pops of color like these berries, that powdered sugar, just really brings all of those colors and flavors to life. I'm going in. I'm immediately overwhelmed, so I don't know where to go. 
<laughs> okay, okay, here we go. We're going for it. Gonna get a nice little crust. Add a berry. Okay. Bon appetit. It's... I need a minute. That date caramel is like the best sub for a maple syrup. It's so much more flavorful, more complex. Those dates and the coconut sugar create this really nice marriage of sweetness. I love using sourdough here too because it's sour, it's kind of tart. Because it's so fermented, it goes so well with the sweetness of the caramel. The berries really make everything pop. I mean, I'm not trying to have like a French toast off with La Note, but I don't know. I think I might. I think I might. And don't get me wrong, I love maple syrup. Sometimes we like switching it up. Mm. I love snacking on dates. They're my favorite thing ever. But this almond butter date caramel really shows how many things dates can do. We just love to date dates. They can do it all.